A very warm welcome to everyone on this second virtual day of NHSR NHS PyCom Conference 2023. My name is Zoe Turner and I'll be introducing the talks today which will be wide ranging today from technical to community development, from international speakers to local and from many organisations as well as the NHS. We have one more virtual afternoon of talks tomorrow and next week's in-person talks are on the 17th and the 18th of October and we look forward to seeing you. Do sign up no matter where you are in your R and Python journey. We'd be just so glad to see you both virtually and in person. Everyone is welcome. Like yesterday's talks, we had a range of times. So we have the plenary talks, which are 20 minutes, 10 minutes for lightning. And today we're really honored to have two keynote speakers. The first this, mor this morning, so the first and the first section from Ryan Johnson from POSIT with what's new with POSIT. And towards the afternoon, the end of the afternoon, Cosima May is coming to talk about building bridges, exploring open source library development in R and Python. The chat and the Q&A is disabled in this Zoom call as we'll be continuing to use our dedicated conference NHSR community Slack channel. Accessing the Slack um, is a bit of an experiment this year for questions, uh, but it's where you can find the NHSR community. And what we found is that some great questions are posed there, but we've also had wonderful conversations and connections being formed between people. So do join us. If you haven't done so already through the QR code that was shared in the opening slide, and I'll be sharing the links through the um, chat as we go along for you to join. A friendly reminder that we have a friendly and welcoming community where there is a high expectation of professionalism and conduct in all our interactions. And I'll also share the NHSR Way chapter on this on the Code of Conduct. And finally, all of our workshops and conference talks are recorded, which will be in a couple of weeks time. We'll put them onto YouTube for later catch up. So we're a little bit ahead of schedule but I can see the first speaker ready to, to take over. And so I'm going to pass over to Pablo, who's going to do a talk on creating a website using Quarto linking RStudio with GitHub. But before I pass over, I'm also going to say that I have very welcome um, assistance from Lynn Howard, who's also going to take over with some of the introductions today as well. So uh, I forgot to introduce Lynn, but thank you very much, everyone. Thank you. Um, I'm going to start with the presentation. So let me know if my screen is clear. So today I'm going to talk about how to create a website in Quarto and then um, how to publish to GitHub. So the content of the presentation um, yeah, it's going to be like um, with the following um, set of set of points. So I'm going to to talk about the um, object in publishing the dashboard, the, the, the website into the GitHub. So basically, we want to talk about the prerequisites. So everyone needs to to be ready to publish this um, website into into GitHub to have a GitHub account, to have R Studio to push the commits and do all the changes and the development of the dashboard, and then to have Git and GitHub installed so you can actually commit from our studio and then put all the changes into the GitHub repo that you will using. Um, I'm just going to follow uh, several steps, like 12 of them. So that's a listing of the steps. I will be describing each of them in detail as we go along. So just this is the listing of the different steps that we need to follow. And I'm going to go little by little from creating the project from the start. And then I will show you the final outputs. That's the, 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 the website one is publishing in GitHub. So first, you need to create a GitHub account. Uh, I've got two GitHub accounts, so I will be using the one called a Pablo Source, so all the uh, Pablo Tester for the uh, for the website, and all the content is already available in there. So you can just check later on the content after this talk that is already there. So you need a GitHub account to start the projects. Then you need to create a new GitHub repository. This is the GitHub repository where you're going to um, store all the contents for the website. So GitHub will be able to run the website and get the, the content of the um of the website published through GitHub using this new repository. Then the first thing that you need to do to start working in the project is create a new um Quarto website from, from RS Studio. So you just follow the create new project and then you choose Quarto website. And then as everything is contained with the website and the project folder, um all the changes will be within the same project folder that will be used for the website. Following along with the same 
kind of um, workflow, you need to use the um, website that you're gonna create with the name of the um, directory that you're gonna use. So we're gonna create it, Pablo, um, with the name of the of the website that the GitHub repo that we just opened, and we we call it that that way to in order to create the website. So you do name your website as the name of the Pablo, um, in this instance, Pablo, this is the name of the GitHub repo, and then the GitHub website that will go along. Then you start to populate the, the content of your website. So basically when you create the Quattro website, you will be presented with these four files. And then this is the about page, the index, the styles, and the project that was part of the project itself. But we will be populating the about that, the index, and the different set of sections that we want to include into the dashboard, into the into the website, and we're going to create a project and populate the content. So the first thing that we're going to do, we want to make sure that the website that we create it get rendered in the right folder. So you need to open the um, the output and then make sure that you've got an output folder. And and this output folder by by default is created, and we need to change that into a new folder that's going to call docs folder. So this is going to contain all the render output from our website. Then you start to populate the content of your website. So one of the files that we got from the Quattro website is this index file. So you need just to include some general um, content for the website. Then you are going to create one tab for your website. In this instance, we're going to present the resources tab. And we're going to populate the resources tab with the standard Quattro document. So you can just populate with the R script and the explanation for the different content of your website as you will do in a normal um, to render markdown document. So this is what we are doing in this screenshot, just showing the different content of the uh, tab that we're gonna create uh, to, to our website. Then it's important to remember that every time you create a new tab for your website, you need to add it um, into the resources file and the quarto.gml file will be populated with a new line that will include the new tab that you're gonna present. Then you need to go to GitHub pages and in order to make it work properly with GitHub, you need to make the pages that will be rendered from the docs folder that we have created earlier. So that will allow us to push everything from our studio into our GitHub website, seamlessly working in a really good workflow. Then um, you need to go into the um, R studio where you will be developing your content for the website. And then from there, you can actually push all the contents and all the changes, do all the push request to your GitHub repo that you have created. So you will be able to populate your website as you work along. And every time you change things, you can just commit them directly from our studio and then populate your website again. Then once you've already just populated your website, um, the, the actions will be triggered by, by our studio. So you can actually um, render the website in our studio and that will be actually populated in the GitHub website and you will get the final output. I might say that when you work with the website, uh, it's important to say that you can actually do the changes when you connect to your repo for the website using two ways. So you can connect your website to your repo using HTTPS or SSH. I recommend to use SSH in order to not to have to enter your password every time. And this will involve creating like a public and um, private key, but that that's that's really helpful for the for the um, for working seamless and getting the the final the final output. So if I'm about to go to the website and just show you the final output, I can actually now navigate to the website. Then um, this will be like the output that you will get on the website when you just populate it to GitHub. And then we've just populated this tab with all the content that we wanted for the resources tab. And then at the top, we've got the home about and resources. And then you can actually include any new content that you want in a really seamless way. And just for a quick example, I've got um, another website for my own personal website where you can see just added some code, added some maps, and it really allows you to expand all the tab that you want for your website and then publish it seamlessly into the hub every time you want. And yes, finally, to go into some kind of further details, um, I want to say that 
you can actually start to to run your website using the the options in, in GitHub to run the pattern and, and trigger a new update of the website. And then we can go into more details into how you will set up a SSH security setting to create a public or private key in different computers in order to update your website and work um, across different computers in order to be able to carry on building your website. And this is more or less the final chart talk that I wanted just to express, and this will be the output from the website. Um, you can just navigate through the website, you can go through the different sections, and then you are able to, to go through different sections for each of the websites. And this was an example that I created, and this resources website has been populated as we expected. And hope you like the talk. Any questions, please let me know. Thank you. Just to um, to mention something something quickly before I, I finish, um, the way you build this website is just including different quarter documents. So it's really easy to include a new um, section in the file and then keep building your website as you will do along adding new sections. And then you will follow the same kind of structure to add the resource tab, the map tab. So whatever map, whatever section you want to add to your website, it will be included in the in this part of the demo file in order to expand and grow your website as much as you can. Thank you very much. Any questions, please just drop me an email or just go to my GitHub account and you will have the details in there. Thank you. Yes, I wanted to mention one one last thing in the in the slides you can find them in my GitHub repo and then you can just check for the different topics that will be good to explore in future talks and and just will be available for everyone to to follow along and there are much more that you can explore in order to expand this website and then building new functionalities and new um sections for for the website um, and the process can really be integrated seamlessly using Quarto. And just in Aria Studio, and it will allow you to grow the website as much as you can. Thank you very much. Thank you, Pablo. That uh, was really interesting. I, I was the as I was watching it, I was uh, trying to think of, of any questions that I might have to ask you about. But uh, I think you were really comprehensive. Um, I can see that it's it's going to be quite a useful talk for us to go back and watch uh, once it's available on YouTube to uh, look at uh, things in more detail so thank you very much for that um and i can see that ryan is ready and raring to go so without further ado we'll go straight across to ryan who's going to talk to us about what's new with posit all right well thank you for the introduction and uh, a great talk pablo uh, good afternoon, everybody, and good morning to, to some folks. Uh, it's really a great pleasure to be here today. I actually had the, the fortune of being there in person last year, which was a really great experience, but uh, equally excited to give this presentation today virtually. So my name is Ryan Johnson, and I'm a data science advisor here at Posit. And you may be wondering, like, what actually is a data science advisor? Well, my role is to make sure that the data science community, so everyone here, is familiar with Posit's open source and professional data science tools, and to ensure everyone is up to date with the latest and greatest features, because we're constantly adding new stuff to our tools. So for today's talk, I'm going to highlight some of our work over the past year. So last year, I gave a pretty similar talk. We're essentially going to give a, another similar talk, but kind of overview the, the newest features. And we're going to keep in mind Posit's vision to serve the data science community. And just to make sure everyone here in the virtual room is aware, last year, we did officially change our company name from our studio to Posit. Now, we're still the same open source data science company, but we wanted to make sure that our name reflects that we support more than just R, something we've always done, but maybe it wasn't always so clear with the name of our studio. And to that end, I want to speak today about some new features and advancements that speak to Posit's vision, which includes the creation of free and open source data science tools, building enterprise tools for data science teams, building a community, making our tools cloud-friendly, integration with other popular data science tools, and finally, data science education. 
So let's go ahead and start with our open source tools. Now, if I had to take a guess, many of the folks here on the line today probably have the RStudio IDE open as I speak, and that's great. Uh, in my opinion, the RStudio IDE has been our greatest contribution to the open source community. Uh, we make the RStudio IDE available to anyone and everyone. And as long as you have a computer and internet, you can download the RStudio IDE and start writing R and Python code completely free of charge. But what truly makes RStudio, R, and Python so great are the amazing packages and tools that have built by the community, many like many folks on the line here today, as well as Posit. And one of the tools that we just got a nice little uh, uh, talk on um, and something that we announced last year at our conference called Corto. Now, if you've never heard of Corto, obviously you just did, um, but just as a kind of get everyone on the same page, it's a scientific and technical publishing system. And I'd certainly encourage you to frequently check out the Corto website, which is what you're seeing on the slide right here, as we're putting tons of development effort into this tool. So we're constantly updating it. And for those that are familiar with our markdown, Corto is very similar with one very important difference and that it's not dependent on R. So if you're a Python developer, you can create a Quarto document like you see here. If you're a Julia developer, you can create a Quarto document. And finally, if you're an observable developer, you can also create a Quarto document. And what's really, what I think is pretty cool about Quarto is that the way it was designed is that it can actually support data science languages that maybe don't even exist today. Um, and we expect Quarto to be around for a very, very, very long time. And who knows, in 10, 15, 20, 100 years from now, R and Python may be obsolete and there may be some completely different languages, but we do expect Quarto to be around uh, in that time as well. Now, Quarto has been around officially for over a year now. Again, we announced it at our conference last year. And I wanted to share some of the more recent updates, as well as some really exciting new features that are coming very soon. And the first one you've seen on the slide here, and depending on your Quarto usage, you may have a reason for annotating your code chunks, uh, like you see here, which is great for explaining your code, you know, something everyone can certainly benefit from. We've also added multi-format publishing. So this allows users to consume Quarto documents in a variety of formats with the click of a button. So here you can see an HTML document with the option to also view it as a Jupyter Notebook. Another new feature is you can include the output of an external Jupyter Notebook in a Quarto document. So here we see some Palmer Penguins plots that we created in a separate Jupyter Notebook called Penguins. And the output is actually embedded in this Quarto document. And finally, you now have the ability to publish individual Quarto documents, as well as projects composed of multiple documents into Confluence spaces for team collaboration. Now, all the features I just mentioned, they are currently available in Quarto version 1.3. That's the most recent version of Quarto. But we have some really exciting updates coming to Quarto version 1.4. And if you want to, you can actually try out these new features using our pre-release builds. Now, there are a lot of things to be excited about in our new release of Quarto, but having come from an academic background myself, I'm just gonna highlight my top two favorite ones. And we're gonna start with what you see here, Quarto Manuscripts. Quarto Manuscripts, they provide a, a framework for writing and publishing scholarly articles. And the main advantage is that you can have multiple notebook, notebooks or Quarto documents as like the, the source of content and computation. And then you bring it all together into a single manuscript that's actually a website. And as you can see here, it can be rendered in a variety of formats as we just discussed. Now, another feature coming to Quarto is something called Typest integration. And that is actually how you pronounce it. I learned that at our conference this year, it's Typest. Types is a, it's a very new open source uh, markup based typesetting system. Uh, and it's designed to be as powerful as LaTeX, which some of you may be familiar with, but it's significantly easier to learn and to use. 
And types can create some beautiful PDF outputs with super fast render times. And here at Posit, you know, we really see it as like the next evolution of PDF rendering. And for those that also come from a scientific or academic background, as I'm sure many folks on the line here do, you can also create academic or scientific posters using this types integration within Quarto. And this is something that when I was in grad school would have saved me uh, hours and hours of time. Now, besides Quarto, we also have some other exciting open source updates, including Shiny for Python. Now, I hope this doesn't come as a surprise to anyone, but last year we did release a Shiny framework for Python developers. Now, for a while it was in alpha, so meaning we released it, but we didn't want necessarily folks using it in production just yet. But in April of this year, so 2023, we moved it out of alpha and into general availability. So it is ready to use for all of your production apps. Now, for me personally, having used R for the majority of my career, Shiny for Python it was a, a great way to get more hands-on Python experience since the look and the feel of Shiny for Python, it's very similar to the R experience. Now, we also released some updates a few months ago, but the coolest part about Shiny for Python, as many of you might know, is that you can actually develop them and share them without the need for a server. And that's gonna be the power of something called Shiny Live. And you'll see that URL at the bottom of your screen, which allows you to run Python code and Shiny applications from within your web browser. Now, the ability to run Python code in your browser, it's a really cool technology. And it's been around for a while and we implemented it in Shiny Live about a year or so ago. But we're actually really excited to share that Posit has also developed a similar tool for R called WebR. Now, WebR, as the name implies, uh, allows you to run R code in your web browser. So you don't need a server, which is really uh, pretty amazing. And with this technology comes a Shiny Live equivalent, where you can create and share Shiny for R applications using only your web browser. So here you can actually see an example Shiny for R application developed within Shiny Live. And feel free to try this out right now. So you can go to that link you see at the bottom of your screen. And if you want to try out the, the Python version, just swap out the letter R for Python. And just to wrap up some more open source updates, uh, in the past year, we've made uh, significant changes to some common packages, which some of you may be familiar with including the GT package for creating tables, RN for reproducible environments, and Reticulate for running Python code from within R. And we also released at the very top of your screen here, we released two new versions of our very popular books, R for Data Science and R Packages. So we now have the second edition of each of those. And both of those books can be viewed completely free online. Um, but if you want a hard copy, um, you can also purchase those as well, if that's more of your learning style. Now, a big part of our goal and something that I'm personally very passionate about is data science education. So here at Posit, we have a few tools and programs uh, that can help improve your team's data science skills. And the first is something called Posit Academy. So Posit Academy, it's about a six to 10 week program, depending on what course you're in, where small groups of your peers, you get to work in groups of your peers, get the chance to work on self-paced tutorials. So you get to work at your own speed, but you also get to meet with a Posit Academy mentor. And so in addition to those self-paced tutorials, every week you meet with your group, you meet with your mentor, and you get to discuss you know, problems, but also get the chance to present some insights that you've actually created using real data. Now we released Posit Academy. It's actually been around for a few years now. Uh, and we currently have three courses available. So the first one you see at the bottom of your screen, the foundations of R for data science, this is perfect if you're a Python user, a SAS user, or maybe you have never written any code before and you want to learn the fundamentals of R programming. And we also, not too long ago, released a pretty similar course for those interested in Python. And most recently, just a couple months ago, we released a more advanced R curriculum called Programming in R. And this is a great next step after completing that fundamentals course 
And it includes topics like uh, writing functions, code best practices, debugging functions. You also get to play around with the per package for iterations. Now, for those that may be in the data science education field currently, you know how challenging it can be to get an entire classroom set up with the proper compute environment. So things like making sure everyone has the right R version, the right Python versions, certain packages, certain versions of those packages, it can be a, a real nightmare. So with Posit Cloud, that headache essentially goes away. Since as an instructor, you can set up a custom environment for your learners and all they have to do is simply log in, that's it. And just so everyone knows, Posit Cloud is a hosted service, meaning it's running on servers here at Posit. And it gives your team quick access to the RStudio IDE. Uh, we've also added beta support for Jupyter Notebooks. And we've also released something called Posit Cloud Publishing. Now, publishing is a very new feature over the past year. And today, you can actually publish a variety of content to your own Posit Cloud instance, including things like R Markdown, uh, Quarto, Shiny for R and Python. Dash, Streamlit, Bokeh applications. Um, you can also host APIs built using Flask, Fast API, or Plumber. And then one of the most recent things we added to Posit Cloud is something called Project Templates. So this is good if every time you create a new project in your daily job, you have to maybe install certain packages, make specific data connections to like a database, uh, maybe kind of import certain helper scripts. You can actually set all of that up as a template and use it for any future project. So I wanna spend some time kind of here towards the end of the presentation and share some updates for our professional tools as well. And pretty much everything I've talked about so far has been our open source and then Posit Cloud and Posit Academy. Now, for those that are not familiar with uh, Posit's professional tools, we currently have three of them. There's Posit Workbench, Posit Connect and Posit Package Manager. And together, these three tools round out what we call our Posit team offering. Now, each one of these tools can be installed on a Linux server, either on-prem, like a physical server right next to you, or it can be hosted in the cloud, which we're actually gonna talk a bit uh, more about here in a second. Now, for the data scientists, the data analysts, so looking at the very top of your screen here, um, they will mainly be working within Posit Workbench to create those insights. Now, currently, we have four IDEs available from within Posit Workbench. That includes the RStudio IDE, Jupyter Lab, Jupyter Notebooks, and VS Code, because we really want Posit Workbench to be a data science you know, environment for multilingual data science teams. Now, using Posit Workbench, your team will be creating uh, valuable insights from your data, things like uh, web applications, like the Shiny apps we talked about, uh, static reports using things like Quarto or APIs. And they're gonna need a way to share those insights with the appropriate audience. That could be your coworkers, it could be your future self, it could be your friends and family. That's where Posit Connect comes into play, which is on the right-hand side of your screen. So Connect is our professional publishing platform. And it gives all of your data assets a home so that they can easily be uh, and securely be shared with pretty much anyone in the world. And then finally, at the bottom of your screen, we have Posit pa Package Manager, which does exactly as its name implies, and that's manage and distribute all those amazing open source R and Python packages across your team. You can even host and share any internally developed R Python packages. And one of the most recent uh, integrations with Posit Package Manager is the ability to restrict access to certain packages as well. So it really gives you full control over what packages your team has access to. Now, over the past five years or so, as everyone is well aware, there's been a growing interest in the cloud. And here at Posit, we know that cloud isn't a one size fits all solution. So that's why we've made our professional tools able to be flexibly used on all major cloud platforms, including in a hybrid and multi-cloud configurations. So for example, you can deploy Posit Workbench, Connect, and Package Manager in virtual mach machines or on Kubernetes in places like AWS, Azure, or GCP. 
If you prefer not to manage the virtual servers yourself, you can actually enable data science development on the cloud uh, within Posit Workbench using things like Amazon SageMaker or Azure ML. And if you're committed to a specific cloud vendor as some larger data science teams are, and you have like a pre-allocated budget, we can actually help you spend that budget on Posit licenses through our cloud marketplaces and plenty of other mechanisms. And finally, if you're a data science team and you just want to completely avoid thinking about servers altogether, that's totally fine. Uh, you can certainly continue to use Posit Cloud, which as we discussed previously, um, it's used primarily for teaching, but we do have plenty of smaller data science teams that completely rely on just Posit Cloud. Now, some of you may have heard this already, um, but we recently announced a new partnership with Databricks. And this is a really exciting integration with Posit Workbench. And we hope it'll simplify that connecting to Databricks workspaces, accessing data, running code, um, and iterating with other resources like Databricks jobs and ML flow uh, models. Now we are also adding support for Spark Connect in R uh, via something called Sparkly R, which some of you may have heard of before making it easier for users to access Spark clusters, including Databricks clusters via Databricks Connect. And finally, we're actually going to be bringing Posit Workbench to the Databricks Apps Marketplace, which allows for a much deeper integration uh, with Posit and Databricks. Now, before I close, I just wanted to discuss some of the community updates that we've embarked on um, over the past year and actually for the past couple of years now. And many of you may already be aware of this, but every single Thursday, our very own community leader here at Posit, her name's Rachel Dempsey, she leads with something called a data science hangout. And as its name implies, this is just a casual gathering of data enthusiasts around the world. We usually invite, uh, invite like a speaker to talk about their uh, experience with you know, their data science, kind of how they got into data science, data science leadership, and the whole community can just ask them any questions that they want. Now, if you're passionate about a career in data science, then I cannot recommend this enough. You 100% should be attending these sessions. Um, you know, we do realize that there's a little bit of a time zone difference here because I think they're at like 11 a.m. Eastern time, United States. If you can't make them live, that's totally fine. Every single one of them is recorded and hosted on Posit's YouTube page. So you can check them out there as well. And finally, for those that want to stay up to date with the latest and greatest open source and professional updates from Posit, we do host an end-to-end -end data science workflow demo that emphasizes Posit's tools. And just like our Hangouts, these are recorded and available on YouTube, but we'd certainly love for uh, folks to join us live. They're hosted on the last Wednesday of every month. And this month, we actually have a special guest from our Tidy Models team who will demonstrate some of the new and exciting Tidy Models features and how your modeling workflows can be improved with things like Posit Connect and Posit Workbench. And that's pretty much all I have. So uh, with that, I hope everyone enjoyed hearing about Posit's updates. Uh, and I wish everyone a great rest of your day and NHS R and Python conference. And I'm happy to stick around if you have any questions. Thank you. Very much, Ryan. That was really interesting. Uh, we do ha have a couple of questions posted already for you. Um, mm -hmm. Firstly, are the plans for Quarto to support Flex Dashboard? Hmm. It's a good question. Um, I can't speak exactly to the timeline. I know it's been in discussion for a while now, um, but whether that's uh, officially rolled out, I'm not sure if there's gonna, an exact timeline for that, but it is something that's been talked about. Good question. Okay. Uh, and Matthew has posted, I'm using the free R Studio Workbench, previously server in production. Is there a free version of POSIT Workbench? I'd like to try out the VS Code IDE features. Yeah, it's a, it's a great question, Matthew. So um, we do have a free version of something called R Studio Server, which it sounds like uh, what you're using right now. R Studio Server just comes with the R Studio IDE. That's it. Um, so if you do want to leverage some of the other IDEs from within Posit Workbench, like you mentioned VS Code, but also Jupyter Lab and Jupyter Notebook, all that is through uh, a paid license through Posit Workbench. So we don't have a free open source version of um, Posit Workbench, just our studio server. 
Okay, that's great. Uh, just a reminder to uh, everyone, if you have any more questions that you want us to pass on to Ryan or to any of, the, of our other speakers, uh, Zoe has been posting the link to our Slack channel in the chat. Um, please head over there and ask your questions and also join the community in general. We'd love to have you along. Everybody is welcome. Um, right, I see Tom is uh, sitting, waiting, ready to go. So I'll pass you over to Tom now, who's going to talk to us about teaching old dogs new tricks. Hi, thank you. Let me just share my screen. Okay, has that come up for everyone? Thumbs up, brilliant. Okay, I think I've got 10 minutes. Uh, we're a little bit ahead of plan. Um, I'm gonna stick to 10 minutes though. So yeah, my name's Tom Smith. I'm one of the insight managers at Nottingham University Hospitals, which is a, a big acute trust um, in the East Midlands. And this talk is called Old Dogs and New Tricks, Learning to Purr. So I'm the old dog and the new trick is learning to use the purr package, which is part of the Tidyverse uh, suite of packages. It's predominantly used for functional programming and uh, you know, functional programming is a complicated uh, word. Uh, there's a cute cat on the front, so kind of how bad can it be? Well, if it's anything like, um, if you're anything like me, this is what I think of when I think of functional programming. So it's it's scary. It makes me want to run away. And, uh, you know, this is more like the cat I think they probably should have used. If that is your pre your initial reaction to per and functional programming, um, we're, we're in it together. And this talk is probably for you because I'm in the same place. So the aims of this quick talk are, first of all, not to be scary. Um, but also, uh, we're going to do a practical introduction to PER. Um, I'm going to introduce a mental model, which has helped me to kind of uh, approach it and get onto the on-ramp. And I'm going to show a, a chart-making example, which hopefully people are going to find easy to adapt for their own use uh, later. Functional programming in and of itself is definitely a topic for another day and absolutely certainly a topic for another speaker. Um, so we're not going to go too far down that road. First up, um, we're going to go to the documentation. So if, if you want to get to proficiency with um, PER, you wouldn't necessarily start from here. And the documentation says that. It says that the best place to start with using PER is the family of map functions, which, which are within that package. And the best place to learn about those map functions is the iteration chapter in the R for Data Science book that, uh, that Ryan's just mentioned, actually. So there's, I think, version two out there. Now it's completely free, it's available online. And if you get a copy of these slides after this talk, it's linked to behind that uh, blue link in this slide. You're stuck with me for the next couple of minutes though. So let, let's carry on um, and you can go and check that out at the end of the talk. Um, mapping is a, an alternative to writing loops. So you think, well, why, why would I need to, you know, an alternative to writing loops? I can already write loops. Um, so I'm going to go through a couple of examples here. Here's, here's a loop. Um, really simple example. We we need a vector to iterate over. So we've got a vector called food, and in it we've got a croissant and a baked potato. Um, if we're using a loop, we need a place to put the results from our loop. So we create a result object, um, and it needs to be the right length. So we check the length of the, the food vector, and we make sure that it's the same length. Um, and then we do the loop itself. So for i in sequence along food, we kind of iterate through each item in the food vector uh, and we do the thing. And in this case, we're pasting the word hot onto the beginning of the vector. So we end up with a hot croissant and a hot baked potato, which is what we wanted. If we do the same thing uh, as map, um, a lot of it looks similar. We, we've still got this, the vector to iterate over. This time though, we, we've got a function. We create a function to do the work and I've called the function heat the food. Um, and then inside the, the function there, you can see we're still pasting hot onto the front. Um, and then at, right at the bottom on line 12 there, you've got the, the map function. I, I call out to map. So we pass it the food and the, and the function we want to call. And we get something back that looks like that. Still a hot croissant and a hot baked potato. Um, this time arranged as a list, but basically the same result. So as a comparison, um, here's back to loop. And here's map. 
not a huge difference between them and probably about the same number of lines as well. So you, you're thinking, well, why is this better? Um, to my eyes, when you're looping, there, there seems to be more boilerplate code. Um, there's more code explanations that have to be put into comments and a comment is optional, so it might not exist. So this is a piece of boilerplate here. It just is defining our result vector and make sure it's the right length. Um, this is a piece of boilerplate that just steps along the vector. It doesn't really do anything useful for us. Um, and this is a piece of code that, although it's actually doing the work, it's quite untidy to read. There's a, you know, there's an I in there. There's lots of square brackets. It's pretty difficult to pick out the, um, get the gist of what we're actually trying to do there because it's a little bit obscured. Contrasting that with the map example, um, this code uh, I find easy to read. Um, we can use function names instead of comments. So effectively we're embedding our descriptive uh, work into the code itself. Um, so here's our function called heat the food. Uh, it does exactly what it says on the tin. Um, and this is the line that does the work and we've not got that I in any of the square brackets anymore. So it's a, it's a lot cleaner to read. Um, and th this is the actual step that we iterate over. So hopefully that's a, a little bit of a sell on why you might want to consider it. It, it leads to cleaner code. Um, the arguments to use the function, the two main ones there are dot X and dot F. So you, you basically have a list and then a function to apply to that list. So the mental model that I use is, is here. So we've used food and we've heated the food, um, but the basic mental model is subjects and action or nouns and verb or raw material plus instructions or ingredients plus recipe. And depending on what mood I'm in, I use any of those mental models. Um, time for a bit of cake to fully press the, uh, the point home. Everyone likes cake. So here's dot X, here's some um, cupcakes. Here's our function, which is a book called The Icing on the Cake by Juliet Stellawood. Um, and the result, if we apply that to the map function is some iced cakes. I managed to find some NHS ones, which is good. If we do the same thing with cars, here's um, some unpainted cars going through a, a weld shop in a car factory. Here's a painting robot being programmed up to spray paint some paint. Um, and if we put that into the map function, we end up with some painted cars. Um, and then finally, IKEA. Everyone loves IKEA. Here's a stack of IKEA flat pack furniture. Here is a really, really easy to understand set of instructions that we need to apply to the flat pack furniture. And here is the Scandinavian paradise that we could live in if we get that right and do everything as we should be doing. Um, so those are, that, that, that's the basic mental model that I wanted to present to you. Hopefully that's useful for people. Um, it's, um, it, like I say, I use, I use these in, in different ways at different times and, and sometimes one makes more sense than another, but that this has been my on-ramp to using the map uh, functions within the per package. Next up, we're gonna do a real world example and we're gonna make some charts because we're data analysts and we've got to get our analysis out into the real world. So first up, we're gonna need some data. I'm not gonna dwell on this, but basically what we've got here is five metrics. Um, uh, we've got some dates which run from January, 2020 to, to kind of present month. And then we got some random values for each of the five metrics. Um, then we need a function to make our plot. So the first thing we do inside that function is we're going to take the, the, the whole data set and filter down to the metric name that, that we're interested in. Um, then we're going to make the plot. Um, and then we're going to save the plot out with ggsave. Um, and finally, we're going to put those two ingredients into the map function. So you can see our metric names there, our make chart function, and we also pass it our data. And what we get back is, is actually the output from the ggsave um, function. It's, it's the file names that we've saved to. But actually what we're probably more interested in is the charts themselves. And passing those in, we end up with five charts um, iterated through and plotted out into PNG files, which is what we wanted. And the power of um, the map function is that everything is self-contained within, within the doing function, within the action function that we've created. So. You know, we're an NHS analysts, so it's not very long before someone asks about an SPC chart. So we can do a very quick modification to our function to, to make it output SPC charts instead. So 
We've changed the name of it to make SPC. Um, we've moved from ggplot directly to, to using the NHSR plot the dots package. So a couple of little uh, bits of code change here. Um, and then lastly, we've just appended underscore SPC to our PNG files just so that we don't overwrite anything. Um, we call the new doing function from the map function. So uh, we, we call this new make SPC function. Um, and what we get right now are five SPC charts. So we've changed the code in one place and we get our result um, back in a nice, friendly, easy to use format. So in summary, uh, the way I think about the per package is really is a sausage machine that you can apply to anything. So there's a sausage machine. Here's some data that you put in the top and what the sausage machine makes is completely up to you because it's, it's how you configure it, but that's another piece of mental model that you can that you can use. Um, some things we haven't covered here, passing other arguments in, um, the shape of the output, so how do you get a vector back instead of a list, uh, map versus walk, so return values versus side effects, um, mapping over more than one variable, so you can use map2 to map over two variables, or pmap if you want to um, iterate over many, many variables. Um, if you're interested in those things, you probably need to check out some of the further material beyond this talk. So Tom Gemmett of NHSR has done a really brilliant video in, in a lot more depth. And of course, Hadley Wickham is the original author and maintainer of PER. So he's got a video out there as well, which you should check out. There's the R4 data science link here, um, the docs for the package, and also a really handy cheat sheet. Um, and finally, if you want to see the this talk, um, it's on my GitHub. Um, as a finished talk, you can also see the code and I've got a couple of other repositories as well, which might be of interest to NHS folk. And that's a really, really quick whistle stop tour of the per package. And I hope it helps a couple of other people get on board with it. Thanks. Well, that may have been whistle stop, but I thought that it was a really good, clear explanation um, I'm definitely going to be stealing your cake metaphor <laughs> when I have to explain it to people. Um, I think that one was particularly good. Um, we don't yet have any questions for you posted over on Slack. No. But I'm sure now that uh, uh, we're done talking and people have time to percolate um, what they've heard, they will be rushing over there to post their questions. Um, and I'm sure Tom will be uh, around to answer any questions as they come up. Very uh, much so, yeah. So thank you once again, Tom. I see that Priyanka is ready and waiting uh, to take over. Uh, she's going to be talking to us about unit testing in R. So please take it away, Priyanka. Thank you, uh, Linda. I'm going to start sharing the screen. <coughs> Can you see my screen okay? Yeah, yeah, that's it. Okay. Uh, I'm gonna try it full screen again, otherwise that will just put it. Yes. Okay, you good. Can you see my screen? Yes, that's worked okay. okay. Perfect. Um, all right. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Linda. Thank you so much, NHSR, for giving me this opportunity to speak with you know this amazing panel of speakers here. Um, so today, my discussion uh, is going to be heading towards unit testing in R, and it's really going to be a mix of talk on emphasizing the importance of unit testing in the data science world. Although this is a concept that comes from software engineering world, but you know the more and more we are all coding. Uh, whether you're a developer, whether you're a you know, data analyst, even in, in and it applies all of those concepts apply to Python as well. So it's going to be a mix of uh, conceptual unit testing and how do we do this in R. Um, and you will, uh, you know, in the process, in during the in the duration of the talk, I will highlight that a good amount of that we all do already, but we have not paid attention to it. Uh, I you know in in the back of our head and how we can. Um, 
you know, develop that mindset. And it's basically the shift of that mindset that we, we need to follow and the approaches that we need to take to be able to formally starting to write our unit tests. So um, let's get going. Um, all right, so uh, to begin with my introduction, I uh, am Priyanka Gagnejo. I am a lead analyst at On Point Insights. Um, big fan of our community, big fan of NHSR as well. Um, so many friendly faces, and I'm happy to be here uh, talking to you all. So um, like I briefly said, uh, you know, the agenda of today's talk is going to be all the whys and hows of uh, unit testing, focusing more on the R world. Um, and <clears throat> so... Uh, well, I'll start with, you know, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, um, and, and bear with me for my bad throat and uh, cold today. Um, so we're going to start with, you know, small, small concepts and we'll then sue them all together. So now before we talk about unit testing, uh, let's understand what is testing, right, in the in the software world, you know, in the data science world. So, you know, in, in the most basic sense, when I say testing, what we are trying to say or what, what, what we all want to do is we want to ensure that my code does what it does. And what, what, what you as a developer, the one who's writing the code, thinks it does. And it does it all the time. So that's purely what we are trying to do when we are doing testing, whether it's manual testing or it's automation testing. <clears throat> there are lots of varieties of this testing. Um, the focus of today's talk is going to be on unit testing, but I'm going to you know sort of define unit testing first and briefly run through the others. Um, so now when I say unit testing, uh, you know, as, as it logically implies, we are trying to check if all the units in your code are working as expected individually, stand alone on its own, right? Now, regression testing is, you know, same units when we are modifying them, when you're modifying your code base, you know, whether it's a bug fix or any other changes that is happening, is your code still running and giving you the same expected outputs? Then moving forward, we are, these are still on the you know, unit level, single piece with that we're testing at a time. Now, when I say integration, when we move to integration testing and, you know, in, in the sense that when we start to go uh, broader in our uh, code such that we are moving to production level, then we also need to think about integration testing, which is about uh, thinking about testing all the elements which are talking to each other, you know, some way or the other in your code. Uh, and so when one piece is working fine, the other piece is also working fine, but when they're talking to each other, are they still working, you know, perfectly well, uh, in which may not always be true for several different reasons. And so that's why it's important to do uh, integration testing as well. Moving on from, uh, you know, succeeding from our integration testing well, we also want to make sure, you know, our code uh, can handle uh, you know, a load beyond uh, our expectations. So when, you know, you're running, you're, when you have a web shiny app that is being put in production, uh, but it, it doesn't, you, you initially did not expect how many users will come in and you thought maybe, uh, you know, 10, 10 members would, uh, the more max that, uh, that are going to use this, but, you know, your app was actually very popular and 100 people wanted to use it at the same time. Can it still handle that load of, you know, number of people accessing it? So, that's what you know that's what's called load testing um and in the similar way we have performance testing is the code running at the best speed it is uh, able to uh, penetration testing testing its security that you know you know the fields that are there in your um, application or your product uh you know there is no sql injection that injection that can happen and um, no other malicious attempts can be uh, made on to it <clears throat> now um you know, switching again to in our world. Now, when we want to do unit testing in R, we must understand what is a unit in R, right? So it's in the most simplest words, it's a, you know, any function that you write in R is your unit. Now, in the beginning, when I started learning about unit testing, uh, in specifically in the in, in my R codes, um, I was actually very unsure of what unit would here mean. And I always used to think, is it, you know, that every line of code that I'm testing, every code of line that I'm writing, should, is that something that I should be testing? Uh, but of course, that's not true. So uh, a function is what, you know, it's it's the smallest unit of your code that you would uh, ideally want to test. And um, uh, now a function, a collection of functions is then, uh, you know, uh, is what is called a package. And then, you know, I think we, we have enough context and, you um, uh, you know, material online uh, talking about that. And so I, you know, again, you know, a big motivation of, have, you know, doing this talk was, you know, my challenges when I was trying to learn unit testing in R 
from a very script level, uh, you know, in a very standalone way. Uh, all I could see was, you know, uh, books on testing from the R packages book and uh, test that package, which is still relevant for what we're going to do uh, and what we're going to talk today. But, you know, I think what I'm trying to say is all those concepts that are applicable or are, are given in the in the testing for packages context, they also all apply to non-package codes as well. So as long as you're using an R project with an R studio, you can, uh, you know, use those um, uh, packages and you know those uh, same methodologies. So we'll move on to um, thinking about why do we need tests. So most importantly, uh, we we need unit tests. Um, you know, as I briefly discussed earlier, to make sure that our code is robust. And what that means is that your code is not going to break whenever you make changes to it. Now, what happens is a lot of times, and most of the times, I think, when you're writing your R scripts, whether it's you know a few lines of code or you know different functions you as a developer or as a you know right the person who's writing the code would actually be doing some testing in the console on your own but we do not formalize it into a unit test and that's where the difference of mindset i was talking about in the beginning so when when we try and encourage the mindset of unit testing we're trying to say that you should be writing unit tests to write your uh, to write a robust code and it should be part of your daily routine regardless of you know what what coding you are doing? You write your code, you test your code. You write your code, and you write your tests, uh, unit tests. Um, and as rightly said by uh, you know somebody called Andrew Muller, if in your in a growing code base, you will need unit tests if you want to sleep well, <laughs> because you know small little changes in your uh, in one function you know can have a cascading effect, which you don't want to uh, you know be looking at you know, five days or maybe five months down the line in, in, in your big project. Now, um, so we've, we've looked at uh, what, what is testing and why we need to do testing. Now, what is that ideal time or, you know, what, what is that ideal uh, combination of when should we be testing? So uh, the answer to that is you should always be testing. You should test early and you should test often. Now, what that means is ideally your... Um, tests have to go hand in hand with your code. Um, now, um, somebody, I think very famous in the uh, software engineering world once said that a software system can be designed if the testing is interlaced with the designing uh, instead of being used after the design. Now, what this indicates is um, while you're writing your function, you, you're thinking about how you will write the test, uh, test script for it. Now, there are also some uh, schools of uh, thought which say test-driven development, but I have personally found it not so relevant in the data science world. So I go with uh, the idea of going hand in hand and going, doing, you know, writing your tests at the same time as you're writing your code. Um, so now thinking about what should be test. So now uh, what you want to test is the behavior of your unit, of the function that we're talking about, not its implementation. And we'll, you know, we'll, we'll talk about this in the example. Now, a typical coding workflow in, you know, for, for our developer, or, and, you know, I, I could say most of us uh, in our analyst or uh, uh, data scientists would be, did you write a function? You play with it uh, in console or, you know, in your, within your script and maybe you comment it afterwards. Then rinse and repeat, meaning we, we just repeat these set of uh, operations um, every time we are writing something, every time we are changing the same function, right? Now, um, again, I want to highlight that when we are doing this experimenting, we are actually still testing. Now, this is what I call manual testing. We are doing some, you know, we are checking something. Um, and this, uh, I want to draw the attention here from, from this experimentation to, um, you know, if if you remember, we, there, there was a talk by about um, debugging your code, and and I actually did a version of it myself in my previous organization. But uh, this was from um, the Jenny Bryan's book, sort of slash workshop, which is about what they forgot to teach you in R. Uh, and then the chapter or the presentation part of the debugging your code talks about a lot of things. You know, in, in terms of how you would do that debugging. Now. How you do the debugging, you know, there are things like, you know, you look at the structure of your data frame, you look at uh, what are your inputs are like, what your outputs are like, right? And all those things are what are important when you are writing that function and make, and testing that that function is running fine. So 
those are the same things that you would be checking in when you're checking your function in console. You're running this function with different side, uh, you know, different types of input values, uh, and and trying to see whether you're getting the expected output, right? So now the same, you know, we we, we want to keep that same uh, thought process now, but we want to learn how to formally write this down so that you don't have to come back to this thing, you know. Basically, you don't want you want to help yourself, you know, help your future self or, or you know other team members for in in the future who will be coming back to this because you now when you're writing this function you know what you want you know what goes into it and what goes out of it now you want to basically ease the process of that documentation by writing you know what are you expecting and I'll come to that in terms of you know what expectations uh, are and how test that package would help us with that so. Uh, but you know, I, I guess the the important part being here in, in in today's discussion would be how do we take this mindset to starting to formally write things down. Um, okay, so now let's think about an example of how you would you know any of us would probably be writing uh, uh you know what's our coding workflow. Uh, similar to just you know what I sort of explained a little bit. Uh, in this case, I'm writing a function to scale the values of, you know, a, a vector that I have. Um, you know, there is a process of doing that and subtracting the minimum value, dividing it by max and minimum. Excuse me. And then I'm taking the range values to find the rescaled value for, you know, if I want to apply it on a column in a data frame or something. Now, the first portion of it was writing the function, right? The, the way we discussed in the previous slide. Now we are experimenting it. Now this one is in the script. You could also be doing this in your console and you know testing if you're getting the right answers and you know things of that nature. Now, um, so in this example, we played with the range as a function to see uh, what is this function resulting into. So it gives out two values. So you know it's basically a range of the two two values. Uh, you know the the vector it is returning, and then we are saying whether it is uh, comparable to the values that we passed into it. Right. <clears throat> so now this was pretty much what all of us are doing. And like I said, we are already testing it here. How do we, you know, Sorry, formalize this into a process? Sorry. Sorry, your slides are not moving, but we don't have a copy. So um, do you have a link to share? Um, hmm. It's not on your slides. Unfortunately, those of you reach me. Um, one second. Let me we have a bit of time because we kind of finished a bit earlier anyway, but um, people wanting to follow your oh, okay. examples. Um, I can't see. I'll have to publish it. I, I was just thinking maybe okay. I'll publish them and post it later, but I can stop sharing and see if I yeah, can. Yeah, try stop sharing and start again just to see if it okay. starts sure. again. Sorry about that. Technical glitches, these things happen. I think people are enjoying it though so far, I'm getting lots of hearts and likes. Oh, you're on mute. Okay, I got the 
um, my sites to publish on my archives. Should I? I can locate that. Can you want to try and share again? I can yeah. Share. Oh, thank you. I'll share that with everyone. Um, I think we got to, yeah, maybe this one. We were about to start with them on test that. Okay, thank you. All right, thank you. Um, so yeah, um, so for the, or I think, let me just maybe step back. Right, so we were talking about, um, am I audible? <laughs> I'm just checking if I'm audible. Okay, I'm on, I'm on and I have unmute and I my video on. All right, so um, yeah, so we, we were talking about that, you know, we wrote the function, we did some experimentation, you know, which is sort of manual testing still. Now, how do we uh, formalize this process? So we will be using test that function for that. Um, and very much, you know, the same code that we wrote earlier. What we're going to now add, and I have this disturbance with my little one. Um, so now test that is a package which gives you, um, you know, uh, a lot of ease in creating uh, the infrastructure that you need to be able to write your tests uh, along with some user of use this package. And for this example, I'm using what's called an expect that function. <clears throat> so in addition to the, you know, um, sort of write a function and experimenting that I, you know, we did earlier, uh, I've added the test that library. Uh, and I'm going to use this function here where what I'm saying is I want you to be able to uh, calculate the range from the function that you run with the given values. And then we want this to be equal to this input value that I'm giving. So basically that manual comparison that we were doing earlier, right? Here, when, when I say, okay, you know, run the function, check the values and then compare it with something, that is something that I did manually. Now I'm just formalizing it in a way that if I run this thing again, um, I don't have to remember what I did. Uh, in order to do this three months later or you know uh, next year and I, I just have to run this again now um, uh, uh, the next step actually in this process is oops, is to um, write the test scripts so now um, in in this way of writing our uh, you know scripting what we do is when we every script is is a function in itself so for example I would write rescale.r as a script which has this function definition and um, I would create test dash rescale.r which would be you know a corresponding test script now you can add as many number of test script you know test functions inside it using the test that function and there are uh, lots and lots of expect underscore you know functions which you can use to ch check for errors check for equality check whether you know it's a vector or, or you know check for length and in lots of you know lots of things that you would be you can think of manually testing like maybe you know checking if, if the value is null so you know think about all the scenarios that you would be thinking so when when we are doing this testing you would want to you would want to think about whether it is working fine or not and then you know which is which is the most basic scenario but then we also want to think about what are the edge cases what are the you know other corner cases um are, are your inputs correct do you have all the inputs so all those things you know you can actually start to write in this manner and uh put all of this into your r script now each of expect uh you know each of your expectation can act as your uh test now what happens is when you run this in uh, in your console or you know run run this as part of your script, it will not return anything if the test passes. Now, if the test fails, then it gives you an error. Um, so, again, moving forward from here, again, this is still sort of a manual way, right? Now, how how do I automate this whole process? Now, uh, like I was saying earlier, the easiest way to do that is using use this package. 
and uh, specifically uh, this thing called use this uh, use test function. Now, in this case, you know, I, I gave this example because we wrote this rescale function. And then I said, I have the code in rescale.r script. Now, when I run this, um, it is going to take care of a lot of infrastructural you know, requirements. For example, um, before this point, I only had an R folder in my R project, which had this file called rescale.r. Now, when I run this, it is going to create a test folder and, you know, a lot of things inside it. And it, it shows you on the console when this thing gets run. Now, it is creating, um, and, and it'll also give you a dummy test script file with, you know, that test underscore as the prefix for this file. And now, once you have that file ready, you can, you know, start to add all those uh, expecting, you know, all the expectations that you want to test. And once you have that ready, you can test either a single file, uh, you know, that single test script by using uh, test underscore file function. Uh, this test underscore file function, maybe I should have used the namespace here. So this is a part of test that. Um, and, you know, so if, so this is, uh, you know, this is something I was testing, but I have, I've been, I'm using my R project. So that's why in, in that folder structure, you would have the next level would be test folder that gets created at previous step. And then there's another folder un inside it, which is test that, and then the, the testing script that gets created, which I said, you know, we are going to be modifying. Now, once you run this, all the expectations, uh, you know, all the tests that you've written inside it are going to run one by one, and it will give you whether the tests ran, all the tests that ran, how many passed, how many failed, and if there were any additional warnings or notes, et cetera. And, I think um, the amazing part is that, so so this was an example for just running one script. Now, if you have multiple functions and hence multiple test scripts, you can actually do this automatically by, you know, using command shift T or control shift T if it's a Windows function um, to run all the tests in a package. And that will basically give you the entire summary of, you know, all the functions that you've written, whatever changes, you know, you know whatever inputs you're giving. Um, so, yeah, I think... Um, yeah, that's that's basically the example that I wanted to cover. Uh, so I guess we are we have an ample time. So I'm gonna summarize that as to uh, why testing is important. I guess my my thought was that if if I didn't have time to you know read through this slide, all I would say is you must do testing if you have you know if you especially if you're part of a you know I mean I, ideally if you're part of a small or a big team or a small or a big project. But especially if it's, you know, if it's an increasing code base that we, something like we talked about earlier, if you want to sleep well, you must write your tests because all the, you know, bugs will come in almost always very close to your hard deadlines and, and that's, that can be excruciating. So um, to be able to handle those situations easy, you know, better in the sense that, you know, you'll be able to debug your functions better. Uh, you will be able to handle the changes as and when, because if you continue to write and update your tests, as and when you're modifying your functions, you will be able to, you know, working in tandem and you will be making um, those changes in real time. So, you know, you don't have things piled up for later in terms of, you know, structural changes for a function that you are uh, working with. Uh, and again, you know, when when you are obviously, you know, no code, no function, uh, sorry, no script or no code base uh, in a project would be one function or, you know, a few functions long. So you know that, you know, there are going to be lots of dependency because when you're writing one function, it goes into another and, you know, the output of that goes into another. We want to make sure that everything is actually running smoothly and the ideal way to do, uh, or, or most sensible way, I think, to, to do that is by creating tests for each of those components. Um, and I think that uh, th these are the, you know, references if you'd like to refer to more of things that I've talked about. And that's all. Um, my contact details are in the footer, and we have plenty more questions. Thank you, Brianka. That was great. Uh, we've had a question posted for you over in the Slack channel. Uh, do you have any tips for testing functions involving plotting? Sorry, say that again. Do you have any tips for testing functions involving plotting? Um, so I think one of the things that I can think of is um, you could probably, you know, test your data prior to putting into uh, plots because um, I have personally experienced a lot of times, you know, when, when you especially, you know, when, when you do things 
when you may be preparing your data, you know, on a iterative basis and through a function, which then goes into your ggplot. If your previous input, for example, you know, the input data or the data frame that was supposed to be there for some reason comes out to be null. And then, you know, you will get um, all sorts of errors in, in your ggplot function, which are not really the plotting fun plotting errors, which is because your input data is incorrect. And I mean, this is one of those debugging ideas that I was saying. So um, I think one idea that I would go with is ensuring that you have you've written your tests for, uh, you know, what goes in your plot is uh, is correct. You know, if, if the, um, for example, if you're using some factors for, you know, faceting or um, if you have uh, numeric values that you want to use to plot, if there are, you know, if you know that there's, this should be in certain range, you can do all, you can write all those tests just prior to your, um, you know, plotting so that, you know, those things are all handled ahead of time. But I would love to hear if anybody else wants to add. Okay, I, I'm sure that's a conversation that can continue over on the Slack channel. Um, and now we have a short break. So, uh, Feel free to go and pop the kettle on uh, and come back for our second half of speakers at five past three when we will be kicking off with John Grimes talking about querying FHIR uh, and clinical term terminology from Python uh, using Pathling, uh, among others. We've got uh, what continues to be a great lineup after our break. Um, whilst you're waiting for the kettle to boil, head over and join the Slack uh, channel if you haven't already. And we'll see you at five past three. Thank you so much.
Welcome back, everybody. I hope you had a, a nice, refreshing break. Um, I'd like to now welcome John um, from Australia. Actually, that's a different time zone now as well. So I'm really quite impressed. It's quite a late time for you. Thank you. Going to be talking about querying FHIR and clinical terminology from Python using parceling. Over to you, John. Okay. Okay, um, yes, um, welcome from the future. Um, it's just ticked over to Wednesday, so um, quite a different time zone here. Um, but that's that's all good. I'm, I'm here today to talk a little bit about um, some tools that we build at the Australian eHealth Research Centre um, to help people work with specific types of data um, based on the FHIR data standard and also that help to work with clinical terminology um, within your data science workflows. <coughs> uh, so my work primarily centres around the intersection between um, data science and health data standards. Um, and and um, and building tools to um, make it easier for people to use standardized forms of data within health data analytics. I'm primarily focused on Fire and SNOMED CT, and I'm the lead developer on Pathling. I'm not going to spend too much time on introduction to Fire today. There's um, lots of resources you can look up. Um, to give you a bit of a grounding there, but I will preface by saying that it's an emerging health data standard. It's it's a number of things actually. It's it's a standardized. It's a framework for creating standard data models for interchange of health information, and it's um, it's widely used for systems integration. So for creating standard interfaces to EHR systems so that they can talk with other systems in the hospital, for example. Um, but it also has many other use cases, for example, building apps to extend the functionality of, um, of healthcare systems. And also um, now that systems are building this interface on, um, it's now providing new channels for data, and hence it's a um, it's a new opportunity for um, data analytics to get new streams of data. And the challenge now is um, so we we can access this fire data, but how do we actually understand it and deal with it? And what tools do we have to um, help us to query it um, and use it? So the primary goals for uh, that Pathling addresses are that um, to assist with the querying of fire data in the context of data analytics. Um, once we have this fire data, how do we make it available to the people who are doing either research or also more sort of um, business level operational analytics within healthcare services. And also, um, how do I make use of clinical terminology within analytics? Um, and how do I bring in the knowledge that is held within um, clinical terminology to my, um, to my um, analyses and training my models? And I'll, I'll, sh I'll talk a bit more about what I mean by that. So Pathling is basically a set of tools that um, enable both the query of the fire, fire, fire data format and also enable query of clinical terminology um, through the um, fire terminology interface. And so fire can be a way of representing healthcare data but it can also be a way of 
representing um, clinical terminology in a standard way. Um, so as you are probably aware, there's lots and lots of different types of code systems um, that we need to deal with in healthcare. And um, it can be a challenge to sort of deal with all those different sets of codes and um, in, a, in a sort of standard way. And also sometimes those code systems come with meaning of their own. For example, um, SNOMED CT is a, is a knowledge resource of its own that's been curated over decades by clinicians that contains lots of different um, relationships within it that um, tell us additional information about the code that we find in our data. And it can be useful to bring that into our um, analyses as additional features. So these are the type of um, use cases that we um, are enabling with this tool. And we have two, two parts to it. Uh, one is the language library side of things, which is what I'm going to talk about today, which is so that you can bring this functionality right into Python. And the other side of it is an actual server, which you can load your data into and you can build apps on top of. You can get data extracts, so you can get a flattened data extract of your fire data out of it. And you can also use it as a data ingest point for a broader sort of pipeline. And I'll, I'll, show, you, I'll show you what that means as well. First thing I'm going to talk about is how do we take this fire data and bring it into a form that's easy to deal with, basically. So fire data, um, fire is... Um, represented as a set of resources. So there's about 140 odd resources within the base fire data model. And these are um, typical concepts within healthcare. So it could be patient encounter, condition, medication requests, diagnostic report, these sorts of things. And each of these um, resources has different elements. The elements can be nested. They can have all different data types. Resources can link to each other. So you can have a patient that gets linked to their medical history and their prescriptions and their diagnostic investigations. So the challenge is we get all this fire data. It comes in either JSON or XML. And we want to get that back into a nice friendly sort of um, format that we can deal with like a, like a um, pandas data frame or an R data frame. So what Pathlink does is it um, can bring this data into a data frame format um, that can be dealt with um, by either by our language libraries. And it takes away a lot of the complexity of, of dealing with the fire standard. So it's the, it, the idea is that it can do the heavy lifting of, um, of dealing with all the intricacies of the standard itself and giving you an interface to it that you're familiar with in, your, in the tools that you normally work with. Um, so once you have, once you bring this fire data into Pathlink, you can then query it using regular SQL, or you can also use um, some special expressions called FirePath that I'll talk about in a minute, which um, make it even easier to, um, to get the exact, um, to reach into the data model and get the exact sort of derived or calculated columns that you need from, from the data. So this is just a, a bit of an example of, of what the, um, the fire, fire data can look like. And then these are the types of um, structures that we use to represent it under the hood within Pathlink. So 
So we have a way of bringing fire data into the data science workflow. And I'll show you some practical examples of that in a minute. But the other aspect of it is that we provide help with querying terminology. Why would I want to query terminology? Well, um, it, it depends on what the terminology is. Some terminologies have absolutely no information and they're just administrative codes or local codes that are just arbitrarily assigned or they're just funding codes um, or they're very coarse grained. But increasingly we have um, um, data from uh, rich terminologies like SNOMED CT that contain a huge amount of information within the terminology itself. And we can actually, um, we actually need a different approach to deal with this type of terminology data than we do with coarse grain classifications and sort of administrative codes. So SNOMED CT itself um, is a very large terminology, um, you know, hundreds of thousands of codes. Um, it's at a very fine grained detail, um, which means that we can get a lot more clinical value out of it than we can get from ad administrative codes. And, um, and, and this is um, a, a really rich clinical knowledge resource, as I say, that's been built up by a lot of people over a lot of time. Um, so we might have a code within our um, data that refers to rheumatoid arthritis of left knee, but behind that code, there's actually a whole bunch of information about that code. For example, the, um, the finding site, it's in a joint, it's an autoimmune issue. It's um, to do with inflammation. Um, and it also has a, a hierarchy of, of codes which it lives within. So for example, more general codes. So for example, we can tell that it's a type of arthritis. Um, we can tell that it's a type of arthro arthropathy of knee joint, for example. And we can use this to, um, to do a whole range of things. As, um, we can get properties from the terminology, but we can also test for its membership within certain sets and do things like categorization. And, and we can also add synthetic features to our models that, and we can learn from sort of higher order concepts from our data rather than really um, fine grained um, concepts that could be rare. So Pathling automates the task of calling out to a fire terminology service. Um, so an example of a, a fire terminology service uh, could be like the NHS England um, terminology server, which um, contains the UK edition of SNOMED and it, they have um, an analytics um, terminology server that you can call out to and you can ask questions about your codes um, as you do your analyses. The, the terminology um, functionality is independent of the, the FHIR functionality. So even if you're not using FHIR, you can still use this to interrogate terminology data. So we can use this for value set membership, querying properties of codes, querying synonyms. We can even use it for language translations as uh, um, many terminologies have language translations like SNOMED CT and LOINC. And we can also use it to map between code systems so we can represent maps uh, in the terminology server. And then we can use that to traverse between different code systems, for example, local specific code systems and more um, general nationally relevant code systems. So here's an example of querying properties of codes from Python. So in this example, um, I'm 
querying out the finding site and the associated morphology for each of the diagnoses. This is like a typical ED um, encounter data set with a primary SNOMED CT primary diagnosis. And I'm using Pathlink to query out two additional columns, finding site and associated morphology from that code, just using information that's already in the terminology. Here's an example where I've actually defined a value set um, declaratively for say um, a mental health issue. And I've said anything that's a type of mental state finding dangerous and harmful thoughts, deliberate self-harm, um, and also any re retired codes that, that um, met that criteria, draw a line around them and test the membership of them and create a new column and filter on that. And this can give, this can be a powerful tool, for example, for patient cohort selection. Synonyms is another one. Perhaps you want to bring in additional text descriptions so that you can do a, um, get better recall in terms of textual search over your records. And again, um, translating between code systems. Here's an example of, we, we've got a map of where we um, map from SNOMED to ICD for funding purposes. And here we're traversing a predefined concept map and creating a new column containing an ICD code. So Firepath is, is a simple language that we use to describe paths through fire data. And it can abstract away some of the complexity of querying what is a nested and um, graph-based structure. Here's an example of how we reach into a fire data set and define a set of columns based on expressions that give us um, a value for each subject resource within that data set. So here we're getting some details of the patient, some contact details, but also whether they have any known diagnoses that um, is a type of heart disease and overall filter the data set to those people who have a recorded um, COVID-19 vaccine. There's also an aggregate function which allows us to sort of define aggregates, grouping, aggregations, groupings, and filters similar to a pivot table. Um, and we can use this to create data frames that are already pre-aggregated and um, using expressions to describe those aggregations and groupings and filters in terms of the fire data. So installing the Python path, Pathlink Python library is, um, is as easy as, as pip install Pathlink and it gives you function, give you access to all this functionality. There's also a server implementation as I um, alluded to before, which um, is, is uh, distributed as a Docker image on Docker Hub. And it allows you to, in, to do the same sort of operations, but through an API, uh, a server API. This is a bit of a diagram of how you can put all this functionality together into a sort of um, data pipeline where you're ingesting fire data, perhaps in real time at one end, transforming it into, um, into data frames and, and doing query operations and then possibly making this um, available to business users and enriching it along the way with terminology um, knowledge as well. The last thing I want to talk about is um, we've been working on, we, we currently already have a, uh, APIs for Python, Java, and Scala. And we have been working on 
an R library and it's going to be released soon. It has feature parity with the Python library and it's based on Sparkly R and Dplyr and um, we're really excited about it and um, we're hope, hoping to get some of you um, trying it out soon and giving us some feedback. Uh, there's a QR code on this page which goes to pathling.syro.au and there's lots of documentation on there if you want to read up more about it and happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Thank you, John. That was fantastic. Hopefully that's fired up everyone's enthusiasm for Pathlink. If you'll pardon the pun. Um, there is a question for you over on Slack, um, but it is now 25 past. So can I ask you, uh, John, to head over to the Slack um, to answer that question? Uh, and anyone who has any more questions for John, also head over to the Slack. Uh, everyone is welcome there. Uh, and next, we're going to uh, be listening to Dan talking about privacy fingerprint. Dan, are you there? Fingers crossed I am, yeah. <laughs> Fantastic. Take Brilliant. Let's, let's get this screen shared and we'll see what we can do. Um, so we could just confirm once I full screen this that we can still see the slides. That would be helpful. Yes, we can. That's great. Brilliant. Um, so thank you, everyone, for the invite. And thanks to the conference organisers. It's been really great so far. Um, today, I'm just going to give you a brief deep dive into Privacy Fingerprint. Um, that's a project we ran NHS England. Um, but before I get into that, uh, just a bit of an introduction to myself. So I'm Dan Schofield. I'm a senior data scientist in the innovation branch of the digital analytics and research team, uh, which sits with the transformation director of NHS England. A bit of a mouthful. Uh, okay, so a bit of a background on me. Um, so I was in academia for a long time, moved across into healthcare about six years ago, worked at NHS Digital, transferred over to NHSX, got a job there, and quite recently NHSX has merged into NHS England. Um, and now NHS Digital is also merged into NHS England, and thus we are all NHS England, so that should hopefully help on that. And I feel that I align quite closely with this XKCD at the bottom. Um, when I arrived, I was probably the person saying that algorithms will solve everything. Now I'm maybe slightly the you don't say person, but to a degree, I'm still the person thinking that algorithms will solve everything. Um, so we'll, we'll see how that goes. Um, and just a little bit more on data innovation. So we have a wide variety of interests, but we sort of try and group into these six areas. Today's talk is really going to touch on the three on the left. So that's synthetic data and privacy enhancing technologies, representations of complex data and natural language processing. Uh, but we also do stuff in simulations, data science and RAP, uh, which is the analytical pipelines that is there. And also we do a fair amount of horizon scanning as well. Um, there's actually more details available in our annual report, which I've linked to the bottom of the slide if you want to hear about any of the other projects in those areas of interest. So onto the main bit. So privacy fingerprint or PrivFP as I've been calling it. Um, what is it and why? Uh, and just so you know, there's also uh, a GitHub available at the bottom there. Um, this project and the whole proof of concept is, is open and could be used by anyone. So a bit of background. Um, privacy fingerprint is really thinking about unstructured data and the different challenges that it has compared to structured data when it comes to privacy. And one of the things we found is it's actually really quite difficult to get hold of real world examples at scale due to you know, the legitimate privacy concerns you would have with unstructured data. And so to think about this, we thought, let's do a proof of concept, let's see what we can do, especially with the sort of generative AI stuff that's, that's happened quite recently. Um, so this became a, a nine week project and the idea was to build this proof of concept called Privacy Fingerprint. And we did this through the ACE framework uh, and working with faculty AI as partners. And we finished this up at the end of March, 2023. Um, the focus here, we were really thinking about re-identification risk in the privacy setting and actually trying to think about within the healthcare domain, what are relevant identifiers we would want to be considering and how can we build out and generate complex examples that would show this and possibly we could programmatically then explore these issues. Of course, we could still apply some aspects to real world data, but we're quite interested in thinking about how we can use new technologies to try and you know, really be able to help people understand the granularity of the challenge. Um, and what were the outputs that we were hoping for? Well, really these were trace bullets through the end-to-end -end pipeline. We wanted to make sure that we'd done every little step that we wanted, even if we didn't expand that out quite as far within the nine weeks. And that was really to think about the different customers we might have in different settings. I might mention some of those later. Just a little bit more on the goals. 
So privacy fingerprint really looks to quantify the privacy risk of a data set or a corpus. We're also considering the trade-off between these risks, the utility of that data set, especially when concerned with sensitive data and the environment that it sits within. So we really wanted to take this from that conversation of this is directly identifiable or this is impossible to identify within a corpus and add some extra stages there and actually maybe even be able to score in a continuum. I think this really comes back to this idea that effective de-identification is really finding the right balance between the risk that you're prepared to take and the utility you want to keep in the data, given the environment that you're in. And actually, quite often, the richer a data set is, the higher the risk of identification of people within it, especially when going beyond you know, standard structured modalities. So what was Privacy Fingerprint when we made it? Well, it pretty much is made of three parts. There's a generate part, a structure part, and a score and explain part. So within the generate part, we used Synthea's patient generator, an open source tool to generate structured data, which was then fed into a large language model. In this case, it happens to be OpenAI's GPT 3.5 Finchy model through their API to generate unstructured data containing that structured synthetic data that we've input. The idea here is that everything is synthetic and you could scale to a, a corpus that actually contains information that you know what's in there and thus explore those challenges. The idea then is you want to be able to structure this data, extract what you've put in to see how well you would do it, which is exactly what a lot of de-identification tools will do. In this case, we use an off-the-shelf tool, Amazon Comprehend Medical API, but you could actually swap that out for anything. And then finally, we wanted to look at that scoring part. And that's where we used uh, a way of estimating the identification risk, a package called PyCorrectMatch. This is based on a paper at the bottom of the page by Roche et al. from 2019. And I'll talk a little bit more about that on the next slides. The final part is that how can we explain what the model is doing? And actually here we've used Shapley values to do that. Um, and although I won't deep dive on that, hopefully within the GitHub repo, you can find out more information if you want to. Okay, so I'm just gonna jump into two of those boxes before. Here we can see a generation example. In the top box, we see what would come out of Synthea. So this is a synthetic patient with a lot of different data types relevant to healthcare. We've also added then this, describe this as if you were a medical doctor to prompt the language model into generating unstructured data. And as we see is a simple example of the outputs that would come out of OpenAI's uh, GPT 3.5 DaVinci model. This contains quite a lot of the data we've put in, but not always all of it. And also it features some hallucinations that the model has had. Now this is quite interesting for us because it brings challenges, but it also makes that the data will be richer that we have within the corpus. And that was one of the big challenges we found in the proof of concept is how do you keep control over the language model, but also get rich data out that makes your corpus useful. Just a little bit more on PyCorrect Match and identifiers. So PyCorrect Match itself is actually a wrapper for a Julia module called Correct Match, again, related to the paper by Roche et al. And really what it's trying to do here is estimate uniqueness for small population samples. This is actually using a statistical model under the hood, which is based on copulas. Um, I'd recommend reading the paper and they have a nice GitHub if you're interested to find out more. But the idea is that we are using likelihood of successful re-identification as a proxy for privacy risk. And as you can see in the tables here, the experiment I've, we ran here is a, a thousand entities that were created using our generator, which contained these particular identifiers. And as we take certain identifiers out, we see that the score changes. So in the left box, you can see by removing a number of different entities from that across the corpus, you reduce the score and get an idea of the kind of re-identification risk and how that's changed for those. Adding things back in again, the score goes up. This is reassuring because this is what we're trying to do. Of course, this is only a proxy, so you start to be careful with it and they should only use it as a guide. The box on the right talks a little bit more about when we started to merge things. So for instance, if you were to simplify gender and ethnicity within the data set, you would get a small reduction in the, uh, the privacy risk score. But actually, if you were to then further simplify date of birth, you got a much larger reduction. And that shows that actually it's not just a single entity or a single um, feature that might be driving this privacy risk. It could be a combination of them and actually treating them in different ways might be helpful. So, just to give you a bit of a, you know, what went well, what didn't go so well, what are the next steps for us? Well, good, it works end to end. That was very nice to see. And we actually got some really interesting experiments out the back of it. And we were allowed to be able to iterate on those different combinations of the components. And they've actually been useful beyond the project itself. We've actually found that we can also iterate over them in isolation or in conjunction with others with relative ease and then run experiments off the back of that. The less good stuff, well, extensions into more complex scenarios is, I say, maybe is definitely gonna require new techniques. Um, also at the moment, we are using a bit of a mix of open and closed source components. You know, I mentioned open AI there. I also mentioned AWS Medical Comprehend. We'd really like to move to open components so that you can tweak 
and tinker with exactly every single part of this and understand what's driving these types of things. Because of course, at the end of the day, if we're trying to measure privacy, we want to do that in a transparent way that we all understand. And we don't want something to be a black box if we can help it. One other thing to mention is that currently the scoring and evaluation components are extremely computationally expensive as soon as you scale. So although it was fine for smaller experiments, it might become prohibitive if you were to try and scale to very large data sets. And also just to say that really, we know we're mapping between unstructured text data and structured data quite a lot, but we've not explored other modalities, how imaging data might come in as we know it's used a lot in healthcare data or other like lab results, et cetera, and how those might feed together. Um, some next steps for us, like direct next, next steps right now, probably switching out some of those closed source components, trying some open source components or more recent language models, for instance, looking at those limit, limitations and how we might mitigate them. For instance, could we bring in a different way of scoring uh, privacy risk? Are there other privacy considerations we should be taking into account? As well as actually thinking about what other example data sets we might generate. Say, could we look at a federated setting? What happens with an SDE? Or maybe even something outside of healthcare. And that's just to say, for me, thank you for listening. Um, you can email us on datascienceNHS.net if you want any more information. Find some of our other projects on our two GitHubs, NHS England and NHSX. And yeah, I'm always happy to talk about this stuff if anyone wants to reach out. Just say thanks again. Thank you very much, Dan. That was a fascinating, fitting and really information dense talk. I'm sure that uh, there will be lots of questions popping up on the Slack. Um, next, I think we've already. Yep, I can see Alex. Who's Hi. going to be talking to us about Palantir Foundry. Hi there. Yeah, a little bit scared about coming to an R conference and talking about Foundry. Uh, my name is yeah, Alex Porter, I work in the Midlands analytical team in NHS England. Um, my day job is a head of analysis and I work with a small team who do various analytics projects around improvement and supporting ICBs across the Midlands region. And I also kind of jointly chair an NHSR user group in, in NHS England. So my kind of, yeah, it feels like I am cheating a little bit on R by talking about Foundry, but bear with me because I think there's opportunities and I think it's not as bad as people might be fearing. So that's why I thought I should share how we can work together with the two tools. Um, for those who don't know what Foundry is, uh, it's a platform, software platform, a big distributed data platform. We got access to it during COVID-19 in England. Uh, we are currently procuring in NHS England a new federated data platform and Foundry is currently working in this place as one of the organisations bidding for the work. We're going to have the Foundry platform in some for about 12 months and what it is, it's just a big fancy Apache Spark distributed data platform where you can have access to lots of data. Um, big please don't ask me at the bottom, I don't know anything about the procurement of Foundry, the politics of Palantir, and if you want to know more about it, there's a really good training resource on the NHS Future site. Lots of useful kind of areas where you can get far more information. I'm going to focus on here is how we've used R a little bit and what sort of things you can do with it. So three, four things you really need to do if you want to get into using R on the Foundry platform. The first thing is to get a purpose, and I'll show quickly what that means and how you work with it. Then there's two ways of working with data. If you're using data sets, which are kind of like the database or the CSV file version of uh, data on a Foundry platform, you can use code workbook and I'll show some examples of that. Or if you're using object data, you can't use R, but you can use something similar. Um, and let me start with the, the purpose. So this is really the core of what kind of makes Foundry unique and interesting and different. Uh, it's all based on something called purpose-based access control, which is you can control your user permissions, who can access your data, how you get access to the data sets, how do you share the content and collaborate. So by here, I've got my kind of Midlands analyst data exploration area where I've got access to lots of patient level data sets, uh, appropriately anonymized, uh, but I can link them and I can kind of do link them to say like locations, I can link out patient data. I can look at waiting times and some segmentation analysis and then some of the performance data sets. This is an area where I can explore data quite a lot. I can work with the data, I can join data sets, but I can't share the outputs. Uh, I also have kind of a purpose where we've got a, uh, a kind of a reporting one, and that's when you apply the permissions that limit the amount of data that you get shared, to make sure everything's aggregated and limits the health of the individual ICB. So depending on what you need to do and the type of product, you need one of these two 
for two purposes to allow you to explore the data in the right way. So sometimes it's for that exploration, sometimes it's for that kind of user facing and contents. But if you talk to the team, it allows you to kind of do some really good analysis of the data. And when you've got access to the data through one of these purposes, it lets you start to use some tools. So Code Workbook is probably the most interesting tool for somebody who's used to using R. It lets you bring in data sets, so you can import a many of the data sets you have access to. So here I've brought through a large outpatient data set with some kind of helpful fields. You can do as many transformations as you like, and you can use a combination of Python, R, or SQL code to transform your data. And you can start to build up these stack pipelines where you kind of pipe it from one to the other. So I've got the outpatient data set here, the raw data. I pipe it into an SQL chunk of code there, and I'm plotting that in a sort of ggplot that I'll show you now. Um, it's all based on uh, Apache Spark. So we've got an Apache Spark session, which you can customize and change. The, the first thing you probably want to do as an R user is to go to your environment and you can start to customize your profile and change what libraries you've got. So here I've got one where I've got ggplot, I've got tidyverse, um, something to kind of interpret some data. But you can search for a huge number of packages. It's got quite a few obscure ones in there. I haven't found anything it's not had, but I'm sure um, kind of some of the cutting edge stuff probably aren't in there. You may just kind of talk to get access to some of these things. Um, I used to get really stuck and wonder why I was on an old version, and I've only really recently discovered some of the version controls. So you can choose what version of the base R packages you're using, and it kind of picks it by automatic. That's worth checking what versions are in there. So you can set your environment up so you know you've got the right thing. And it lets you kind of mix up R and Python and different libraries. Um, so once you've set that up, you can kind of run and execute your code. Uh, you can click on the boxes and it gives you a demo of your code. So first I'll do some basic SQL. I'm taking my couple of columns, I'm doing a count and a sum of cost. I'm doing a little group by on that data for all activity within a year. Because it's big and distributed, it runs pretty quickly, uh, really quickly. You have good outputs on this for the size of the data. Um, so I'm taking my data from there, I'm going to pipe it into the R bit. And that's probably where you're most interested. So if you want to run some R, you have to put it into a function. The function takes in uh, as many data sets as you've created. So I'm only using one data set, but you can have more than one uh, data set or output of any transformation as an input to this. You can refer to your libraries. So I'll kind of make sure I'm using the ggplot library here. Um, I'm not sure I need to reference them or not, but I have done here for the case. And you can then do uh, a ggplot. So the basic two things that you can create using this are ggplots or plotly plots, and then they can use them in other kind of outputs. Unfortunately, I've not found a good way of doing tables, um, which there isn't a good way of doing tables in Foundry. I really wish I could do a nice kind of R table in there, but I haven't quite got the answer there. But you produce your charts, you can plot it, and then the important thing to make sure your code runs is you return either the data set or you return a null to say, actually, that's the end of my data flow. So I can kind of pass it on to the chain of data commands. So please don't judge my chart. Here's my really basic ggplot that's come out here. I'm comparing a couple of uh, couple of data items here. How many outpatient attendances we have? How many appointments we have by the type of uh, by the type of uh, kind of classification of that activity? Now you might see I've added a, a theme. So uh, last year's R conference, Cara Thompson did a really good example of how you create a function to make your R plots look better. Doesn't really help in my case because it's still a hideous chart I'm doing, but you can apply global code to something. So over here on the uh, the right hand side, we've got these kind of two buttons. It lets you create some global R code. You can generate functions and make it work across any of the modules that you've got. So you start to build up kind of quite a useful little mini IDE to kind of work with your code and generate your, your content and get your visualizations in there. Uh, what I'm going to say next. So next thing that's useful is parameters. So you might want to kind of parameterize some of this code so I can do it for a different system or change the treatment function code or change what I've got those axes. Once you've turned your code, you can turn something called templates and uh, use parameters. So there's a bit of detail to go into to explain this. Read the documentation because it's very useful to get down to this. But it lets you effectively, on runtime, it changes parts of your code. So here, instead of passing the, the variable in, it actually rewrites the code to pick up the things you've chosen for your access from those parameters. So it's 
uh, not quite how you, you initially expect it. I thought it passing the variables on the call thing, but it doesn't actually rewrite your code for you. It does it on the fly, and you can use that elsewhere in the code. So lastly, show you how do we get this to customers, and you see this copy for notepad button at the bottom. Let's you take that code, drop it into a report, and let's kind of do your Python notebook or your R Markdown report, type in your text, um, copy in your reports and your bits and elements from other parts of Foundry, you kind of get your output. So this is a bit similar to uh, kind, of, kind of your, your, your R Markdown workbook, but it runs on the fly, which is kind of neat. So you haven't got to get users looking at that report and uh, kind of editing the code or viewing it. They just get the nice output with the, with the output there. So, that works well if you're doing data sets. If you're using the object-based stuff, which is what a lot of the performance data is, you need to learn something called Vega plots. Now this uses the uh, grammar graphics approach uh, using a different way of kind of coding up the data. It's a bit similar to how you do your GG plots and unless you do some fancy charts. There's a really good tutorial to all the different kind of types of charts you can use for this. Uh, I suggest looking at that so you can can't do it using one of these. Um, I'm, you know, I don't know what kind of charts you want to be doing, but imagine there's an example of everything you want to do and tutorials about how to do different types of charts. The future, I'm going to kind of skip to the end because I'm a bit behind on time. There's a lot of alignment between what Posit and Palantir are doing. The one exciting thing I think is coming up is bringing our studio and Shiny apps within the code workspaces area so you can start to do more things with our natively in a Foundry platform. Now, I don't know what, I don't think we've got access to any of this, but there's a lot of potential there in terms of possibly running shiny apps and linking to those data sets and working in, in this environment. Uh, Thank you very much you can... indeed, Alex. That was a fascinating talk. Uh, there's already a question for you over on uh, the Slack channel, uh, but we do need to now move on. Uh, Mia is ready and waiting raring to go to tell us all about the cross-government and public sector data science community. Thank you. I'll, um, I'll jump right in, just share my screen. Uh, so hello everyone and thank you so much to all the speakers so far. Uh, my name is Mia, I'm from the Data Science Campus, which is a part of the Office for National Statistics, and I'm here to talk to you today about the cross-government and public sector data science community. Um, so what is the data science community? This is a community that's been around for, for uh, I'm going to say, about eight years, uh, run by different departments at different times. But at the moment, it's in our hands. And what we've been doing for the last year is, is try to grow it to, to be more than just the cross-government data science community, but the cross-government and wider public sector uh, data science community. What we want to do is to bring together data scientists and also analysts who use data science tools uh, together to build their networks. We want them to share their knowledge, to promote cross-organizational learning, ideally to start collaborating rather than duplicating. Um, and on the whole, we think that all of these different things, this, these capability building programs as part of our community, we think what they're going to do is increase the use of data science across the public sector, and that itself is going to drive impact on the public. So we do this in a variety of different ways um, because different people like to engage in different ways. So we, we run monthly meetups. In fact, our next one is taking place on Friday um, and I will give more information about that before I forget. Um, so we have monthly meetups. they last about an hour and a half and each one will, will be around a certain theme. So we've had themes before like data ethics in government. We've had uh, using text data in the public sector, but we've also had kind of more general things like what to do if you make mistakes and how to deal with them, also how to correct mistakes. Um, and actually this Friday's meetup is called Everything But the Data, where we'll be hearing from delivery managers, from industrialization teams um, and from product owners as well. So we're, we're on Friday, we'll be learning kind of about all the things that need to be put in place for us to do data science projects. Uh, in the past, we've also run um, two week long festivals. This year, we're doing a showcase instead of a festival, and I'll give more information about that later. But all of our events are virtual, so anybody can attend. Uh, we don't record them, but we do uh, welcome anyone in the public sector to attend. 
Um, in between our meetups, there are loads of opportunities to engage with the community. We have a monthly newsletter where we send out kind of a roundup of all the stuff that's going on in public sector data science, whether that's interesting job postings, whether it's other events that are taking place, learning and development opportunities. Um, and if you are more interested in something that's a little bit two way, we have a Slack workspace as well. Um, it's not as open as the NHSR uh, Slack space. It's open to anyone in the public sector. So that's we base that on email address. Um, and that's anyone in any ALB, any local government organization, and of course, central government as well. Um, Many of our meetings generate resources, whether that's slides, etc. We post those on a, a platform called the Knowledge Hub, um, and that's again accessible to anyone in the public sector. So you can look through slides from previous meetups as well. And at the moment, we're using the Knowledge Hub, but we're hoping to move that to a more open platform uh, to host something that we call the Living Library. That's a kind of micro mentoring scheme where people with expertise in various different areas of data science can put themselves on this library shelf and say, hello, I am a book about, let's say, text data. And members of our community can those check those books out, which means to have a little conversation with them about that area that they're interested in to maybe give them inspiration for doing projects or for developing their skills a little bit further as well. So it's kind of a pilot scheme at the moment, the Living Library. We're hoping that by the end of the year, it will be um, a little snazzier. But so far, we've had really great feedback from both the books and the people who check them out. And then beyond that, what we do is we try to um, strengthen our partnerships across the government because we know there are loads of communities and networks out there that support kind of similar skill building programs. And just as much as we like to promote collaboration over duplication, we do not like to just replicate other networks that are out there. So I work with Zoe quite regularly to talk about what NHSR are doing and what the community are doing and how we can kind of share our resources and that sort of thing. I also work with the RAP Network, who are also based in uh, the ONS, so that does make life easier. Um, and I work with people like uh, data community managers um, in other areas of government as well. Um, and we also have something called the Data Science Leaders Network, and that is a network for all of the uh, heads of data science in the civil service. Um, and that's where they can get together and talk about kind of strategic decisions that they're making for their data science teams. And we as a community can directly feed into that because we kind of act as a, a shadow board for the data science leaders. So that gives the members of the community opportunities to feed into the decisions that are being made at the top of um, kind of government data science. And on top of all of that, we have um, a number of sub communities as well. So while our broader community, we would call a community of practice where we can get together and talk about kind of the, the whys and the wherefores of data science. There are a number of sub communities as well. I'll go into more detail about that. The important thing about our community is creating a safe space uh, where people feel that they can freely talk about the projects that they're working on, which is why we have to make sure that things like our Slack workspace is relatively secure and that information isn't leaving the public sector, but also that we have appropriate codes of conduct that mean that people can feel confident getting up in front of a group of people they've never met um, and talking about, let's face it, things that we're all learning in, regardless of how long you've been working in data science, uh, none of us can really get up and claim to be an absolute expert. So working on making sure that our community is inclusive, that we're supporting everybody who very kindly volunteers to speak for us, uh, that we're non-judgmental, we're all learning, we're all curious, and very importantly, we're all very accepting of failure, because if we're not, then we don't really do any work at all. I mentioned the sub-communities, and that's um, uh, it's quite a good day to be talking about it, actually, because as of today, we have four active uh, sub-communities. Uh, the Tech Data sub-community, um, I imagine many of the people on the call have engaged with before. They meet every two weeks to talk about all things text data, NLP, LLMs, whatever you want to do. It's far more technically detailed than I ever really understand, but it's a wonderful group and I love going along to hear about what they talk about. Graphs and Network sub-community is also um, a fairly active one. It came out of the ONS, as did the Tax Data sub-community, um, and is now open to, to all of the public sector. Um, the Local Government sub-community has been um, kind of in the works for a while this year. We're launching something called a Project Clinic um, later this year, where people can come and talk about projects that they're working on that they need a little bit of a steer on. Um, and then as of today, we also have the Privacy Enhancing Technology sub-community, which is run not by me, but, um, and I should say this, but all of the sub-communities, I just support the people that run these, these sub-communities. The people that run them are people that know stuff about these areas far beyond what I do. 
Um, and the pet sub community is being run by a collaboration between the data science campus where I work and the CDEI, the Center for Data, data Ethics and Innovation, which are based in the Department for Science, Innovation and Technology. That was three acronyms that I had to quickly translate in my head. We've got a couple of other, others that are in development as well. We're hoping to launch a data ethics sub-community and a functional programming sub-community as well. So all in all, what I can say about the community is that we're really busy. There's loads going on. And regardless of what you do in data science, whether you're really interested in developing skills in a specific area or just more interested in getting kind of an overview of what the public sector data science landscape looks like, there's many different ways that you can engage. Lots of these things are new as of this year, whether it is kind of launching these sub communities, um, connecting with different um, networks and groups, and um, and then launching things like the Data Science Leaders Network. Um, but yeah, we have new Slack members every month, and at the end of the talk, I will post to Slack um, some ways that you can get involved with the community, join the Slack, and all these sorts of things. Um, and we do have people attending our events from across the public sector. And this is the thing that I wanted to come today to really emphasize is that even though it's called the cross government and public sector data science community, it's the that wider public sector that we're really keen to um, engage with at the moment. So don't feel like it, it is just for government. It is for the whole of the public sector. Um, and that's something that we're really pushing at uh, an event that's coming up next month. I can't believe I'm saying that, but it is next month. Um, the Data Science Community Showcase uh, is a virtual conference taking place in the last week of November. Um, we're, what we're aiming to do with this is to bring the community together and strengthen our partnerships with different um, networks and groups as a way of showcasing all of the opportunities that are available to analysts, data engineers, data scientists across the public sector uh, to grow your networks and engage in that kind of knowledge sharing that supports collaboration. So the, the theme of the whole conference is the power of community, because uh, I love a little bit of cheese, uh, but we've broken it down into three content strands. Uh, the first day is all around your career in data science, where we'll host something we do quite often, which is a career panel, um, where we bring together data scientists at different stages of their career, where there are people, whether it's you know people who have just joined the field or people who are leaders in the field, and we give the audience the opportunity to, to grill them essentially in what their career has been like so far. Um, the second day is something we call the data science tool shed. That is an opportunity to showcase again, all of the amazing tools for analysis that are being built across the public sector. What we want to do on this day is really um, support coding in the open and building tools to share. So if you have um, a tool that you kind of that is open source that you want people to be using i'd love to hear from you we can take the opportunity uh, to showcase that tool and you can use it to promote it and um, we've done an event like this before and it was it was really great to see people demonstrating the kind of tools that they're developing to support data science in the public sector and i'm really looking forward to having a whole day of it on the third day, we will be talking about making an impact with data science. And this is something that I think goes way beyond just the data scientists and government. Uh, for this one, we've teamed up with the Emerging Technology Community, which is run by the Government Office for Science. We're gonna be asking about how, um, how emerging technology policy is informing the way that we do science, data science. But we're also gonna to speak to other policy professionals who are kind of putting the data-driven decision-making into action. We wanna find out how the data science that's done by people in the public sector is having a real impact on the public. So I think that's gonna be a really exciting day as well. We've got some fantastic speakers lined up um, and I'm really looking forward to it. I, I was hoping I'd be able to share the Eventbrite um, pages today, but we're still putting them together. So this is very much breaking news on the uh, data science showcase front, but I, I will put a whole bunch of links on Slack. The most important one will be to please join our mailing list so that you can hear as soon as those events are published. So here's a bunch of links that I'm gonna go and put on Slack in just a moment. Um, but the most important thing to say about the community is that it really is supposed to be um, for its members. It's I really don't get anything out of just doing things that I think will be fun. Um, it's much more important that I do things that I think will benefit the members of the community. So I'm really keen to hear anybody's thoughts. If you've never engaged with this community before, I'd really like to hear from you because I was I would like us to reach you. So if you feel like there's kind of areas of data science that we're not covering, if you think that 
you know, you've maybe heard of us, but none of our events have looked very interesting. I'd like to know. And if there's just things that you would like to see discussed when it comes to public sector data science, um, I'm interested. I'm very much, um, yeah, I'm very, I'm very, very keen to hear any ideas for what we could do more with the, the community, what we could do differently. Um, and if you'd like to get involved, whether that be speaking to the community, whether it be supporting us with planning our events, um, or even if you want to be an admin for the Slack workspace, like I would never complain, um, please do make use of that email address. Let us know what, um, what you'd like to do. I think I've managed to finish ahead of time. <laughs> But that's, thank you so much for having me. And I really hope to see some of you at a community event soon. Thank you very much, Bea. And likewise, we look forward to seeing you over in our Slack. Thank you. Next this afternoon, we have Cosima talking to us about building bridges, which I think follows on quite nicely from Mia's presentation. Take it away, Cosima. Cool. It definitely does. It couldn't be a better like kind of bridge that we're having here, um, introducing the talk that I have. Um, so thanks everyone for joining. Um, at like kind of here, it's not really late, but it's kind of late. It feels like after a long day. Um, so thanks for sticking around, and thanks also for inviting me to speak at this conference. It's really looking at the agenda. It really kind of weaves in Python and R which is really nice. And this is also essentially what the talk is about. So I'll talk about my experiences when developing in both in R and in Python and packaging your functions up as packages um, and what it means to dive into both worlds and also what we can get away from, from these worlds. So before we get started, just a few words about me. Um, so I hold a PhD in political science where I also discovered my passion for developing open source software. Back then it was mainly in R and I used Python whenever I needed it because these th some things are not always available in R. So I went back to Python and now I'm working as a data scientist and I mainly work with Python in my daily work life. And I always felt like switching between these two languages is not too complicated. And it's actually easier than expected. And, and once you're more, more in these languages, there are surprising parallels in how things work. And that's why I initiated the uh, Pi Ladies and R Ladies event series, where we invite speakers to share their experiences on both, uh, on both, on working with both languages and on working in specific use cases, such as plotting in, in R, definitely is probably easier, but there are tools in Python that can do the same and that follow the same logic of, of ggplot, for instance, also AutoML, where there are packages that work equally well in both languages. And besides, I'm also a Google's Women Tech Makers Ambassador, where I seek to promote greater diversity in these communities. And with that having said, um, let's dive into what we're covering today. So, can the I just talk? check, Osama, sorry, you're not showing sure. the slides. And I didn't know if oh, you were trying sure. to. Oh, I'm sorry. It was, it was fantastic to listen to you anyway. <laughs> yeah, that's but good. But you might want your slides showing. Sure, I want Thank them. You. I definitely want them. Here they are. They're beautiful. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks for, for the quick heads up. Um, so that's, that's good. Oh, it works better if you see them. Um, it definitely does. So what we're doing today is we'll cover two parts of or the talk will cover two parts. The first part will be about Overview R and Overview Pi. These are two open source packages that I developed. Um, and the second part will be about comparing package development in both Python and R to kind of like my kind of thoughts on it and also what we can take away from it. But let's dive right into Overview R and Overview Pi. Um, so Overview R and Overview Pi are packages in R and Python that aim to simplify your exploratory data analysis, which I think comes at the very early stage of everything that you do with the data. And Overview R grew, uh, is more grown up and it was part of my PhD thesis. So back then I had some kind of challenging um, data wrangling and merging tasks with a time series cross-sectional data. Um, and I basically packaged up the functions that I was um, developing back then and that I that were living on my local machine, and I published them as Overview R. 
and Overview Pi is a bit younger. I started working on it a while back. Back then, the name was a bit different. It got taken meanwhile. Um, but now it has its first um, release and its first, first version is out there. And you can generally split the functionalities of these packages into two camps. So on the one hand, we have tables. And on the other hand, we have plots. And um, here's just a really brief overview of what the packages can do, but feel free to dive into the documentation. And I hope it's all presented there in an approachable way on the packages websites, if you're interested in that. What we'll do today is I'll showcase a few functions that exist in both packages. Um, and we'll be using the NHSR community data, namely the data on bed numbers and how many bed beds are occupied, um, disaggregated by organization. Um, and that's what the data looks like. And as I said, whenever you start working with data, you wanna have an overview of the data. And the most important part for overview R and overview Pi to work, just as a side note, is that they need some kind of uh, time unit and some kind of ID. So the time unit could be year, it could be month, it could be whatever you have, and the ID could also be anything. So coming from PolySci, um, it's, 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 I'm working with, or I used to work a lot with countries and, and, and years, but I know also people who applied the package in psychology and they were like kind of analyzing um, survey responses. So it works for any use case that you can think of that have these kind of dimensions. Um, and if we dive into the first function, uh, let's look at overview tab. It's the very first function that lived in overview R and it started off with the idea in the back that when writing academic papers, it's always good standard to publish an overview of your sample because you want to compare whether you're comparing apples and oranges or whether it's kind of the same thing, right? And what I've learned is that researchers often do it by hand. And obviously that's cumbersome. The larger your data gets, the more cumbersome it gets. Plus it's, it's error prone, uh, something that you don't want to have. And so I packaged the functions. And um, as I said, it's, it's part of the initial version of the package. If you're interested in, in seeing how it works, there's also a link in the bottom right where you have a notebook that can walk you through the function. So you can also experience it yourself. But um, as we see here, it's a pretty simple um, function. You have the data frame, you have the organization name, the ID, and you have the time. And what you get out of it is a tibble or a data frame. Um, it's not super beautiful, but it gets more beautiful once you package it with the overview LaTeX function that makes a publication ready output out of it. But what you can already see here is that there are some kind of differences. So some organizations, they are not covered for the entire time frame, but only for shorter time frames. And the same function also lives in overview Pi, where you also get a data frame out of it and where you can also see whether there are differences or not. Um, if we move on and look a bit at the plots, there is one function that lives in both packages. Um, that is really good if you don't want to have a time specific, a time series centered focus on, on your data and its overview and A. And you throw in just the data frame that you have at hand and it displays the missing data that you have in your data set. Again, overview R is a bit more grown up, a bit more mature, but um, overview Pi also has this function. So here, same syntax, same logic, and it's intentionally made like that so that people transitioning between the packages can also easily apply them in the different languages. And then there is another cool thing that is right now only implemented in overview R. It's called overview plot. Uh, which is basically the equivalent of overview tab that we've seen before. But instead of getting a table, you get a plot and you get timelines. So for me as a visual person, this really helped me when I was performing all these kind of time series tasks, uh, because you can also color the lines depending on different periods that you want to look at. And you can easily see if there's a consecutive line, 
there they are connected. If there is only one dot, it's only one year of an observation, and we do see that the data has gaps. So that's something that I, I, I as a data scientist, would definitely want to to look into. Um, with that having said, and um, having learned about these two packages in the that that they were developed in two different um, languages. Let's dive into R and Python package development. Um, and again, as I said, I, I've developed packages in both languages, both as OSS, what you see here, and also as internal packages that we use at work. And I can say I, I really enjoy working with both languages. And one reason for that is because both languages are beautiful and they tell kind of tell the individual stories. And you will see what I mean with that in a bit. Another reason is developing packages is pretty similar in both R and Python. And what we'll see in a, in, in a second is how each step compares to each other in these languages. So what you do first in either Python or R is you first create a library. And for those of you new to package development, you can think of it as like kind of bundling up a collection of functions, um, document them so that others also now know how to use them and then write them in a standardized form. And we heard earlier, I think also about DevTools. It's a package that you can use in R for that. So you kind of get a boilerplate for what you need for your package. And you kind of bring your functions into this kind of template. Similar things also exist for Python. So it's, it's, kind, of, um, it's kind of pretty straightforward here how to go from there. So once you've brought the, the function that you've written in the form that you intend it to be, in the next step, you can make your package available. And one of the first steps that you often will do is you put it on a remote repository such as GitHub where others can use them but using means installing them in their own working environments. And that's really, really nice to have it like that. But you can also go one step further for sure. And one step further, further would be you make them available in a package index. And the package index would be, for instance, PyPy for Python or CRAN for R. And PyPy is, is quite common in Python. CRAN is the comprehensive R archive network. So whenever you st install something in using install.packages, it comes from R, uh, from CREN. Um, and there are of course other package ind indices, but uh, for this talk, I'll focus on these two because those are the ones where I have experience with. Um, but if you're curious, there are specific ones like Bioconductor or Bioconda for specific fields that have more rigorous or different rules and regulations applied. So there's definitely a lot of, um, diversity wherever you want to, to submit your package for. Um, so, and with that, it's, it, it kind of looks pretty similar, right? So you have the library, you have the remote repository and you have the package index. With Python, there's one additional thing that comes in that I would recommend. It's um, you want to have a safety net in a way because with Python, and I'll talk about that in a bit, um, it all comes down to to environments that you're developing in. And Docker and poetry, at least I like, I, I think poetry is really, really nice tool. I know there's some kind of controversies about that, um, but it's, it's a really neat tool that helps you to package things up in a way. Um, and you will, you will learn in a bit what it's about. Um, so definitely keep that in mind when you work or when you start developing packages in Python. Um, and now let's talk about the differences. So we've seen the similarities, but what are the differences when developing an R and Python? Um, let's first start with R. Here you have many support packages that help you build and test your package. We heard about test that before, for instance. Um, I mentioned DevTools as well. It's really like an ecoverse that is well structured that where packages build up on each other and where they, or at least I, I, I perceive them also as good complements towards e each other. Um, and as I said before, one of them is DevTools, which gives you a package structure, kind of this boiler plate, if you want. Um, it ensures common developing processes. 
and it supports your submission when you submit something to CRAN and where it also encourages you to perform rigorous tests. So if you have ever submitted something to CRAN, the very last step that you have is it asks you a couple of questions like, is this your email address? Did these tests pass? Did you do this and that? So it really, really helps to, to, to get an understanding whether your package is somewhat ready to be submitted. Um, and all in all, I think these kind of rigorous tests that we have at CREN um, are really helpful. And that and and I don't know, like if you if you submit something there, you know that you have to wait for like 24 hours until your package is really published. You may get follow-up questions from the CREN team, and you also may get emails sending you something during your holidays saying you have X amount of time to fix this um, because otherwise your package may break, which is really nice and re really is kind of ensuring that the package that you develop is is good, is, is maintained and it has some kind of consistency there. Um, and I believe um, one of the reasons why this is the case, why it's so consistent and so, so, so it, why it comes as a whole package in a way is also because of the community. Traditionally, R is more for st uh, statistical analysis. So it's a smaller community, a homogeneous community, um, where people, where it might be easier to adhere to certain standards. Whereas with a Python community, traditionally it's an all general purpose language. So people use it for different things. And then you have someone working on the back end talking to a data scientist who has different kind of uh, perceptions of things, which logically make it more difficult. So, um, and the last thing that kind of stands out for R is um, to develop your, or to, uh, to publish or to market your package, not publishing, but to market your package in an easy way. And I think package down really improved over time. And it has so many nice features in there that allow you to based on your standardized documentation that you have all been doing so well, you can easily publish a website and share what your package can do. And, um, one, um, and now turning to Python, one thing that kind of surprised me when we go back to what I talked about CREN, that it can take hours until your package is there, that there are rigorous tests, that there may be follow-up emails. And I remember my very first submission there was a follow-up email asking to to change some kind of wording in in my in my documentation. So it's really like nitty gritty details, which are essential if you want to have a common form. And what kind of surprised me about Python is once you upload something to PyPy, it can be done within seconds. So it's really you push, and it's there, and you can use it. And it felt like coming from these strict rules, it felt so unreal. Um, and based on my experience and what I've read, there are no rigorous tests and no real follow-ups. So your package is just there. Um, and when, when, I, when I saw that, I obviously, I mean, you, you kind of think of the consequences here, um, which kept me wondering because ideally everything goes well, least or a bit less ideal, there are some minor bugs that let it fail. But what if something intentionally packaged something up that could do harm? Um, and that's something I didn't really find an answer for, um, but which keeps me thinking over this concept over and over again. Even though we're complaining about the rigorous tests at CREN, it might be better in this case. Um, and talking about developing Python packages, in the beginning, I was a bit lost because in R, as I said before, you have these kind of um, dev tools environment and a blueprint that is working well. Um, but then I discovered a cookie cutter template, which is kind of the boilerplate that you can use. It populates a package and you can then fill it in with your functions. Um, and then there is poetry. Um, I do have a couple of links at the very end on more package environments and packaging tools and, and these versioning things. There is a really cool blog post on that because we could essentially fill an entire talk about that. But poetry is is one of the tools. They had a major uh, break in in development, so it wasn't really backwards compatible, and people were really frustrated about that. Um, 
but for me, it works really well. So I, I do like this tool a lot because it's it's a multi-purpose tool. It's not only about packaging things up and pushing them to pipe pipe, but it also takes care of your dependencies, sets up virtual environments. So you have all these things at hand in one flow, which makes it really, really nice to work with. Um, and working with Python, talking about environments is um, really challenging sometimes. I mean, I, I would lie if it wasn't. So it's not the code, but it's really these environments um, that keep you struggling. Um, so you usually start with a virtual environment, install your interpreter, which is your Python version, and then load packages into the environment. But if you work together with others, you need to make sure that you're all working in the same environment. So here is where poetry and also Docker comes in and make your life easier. Um, and there's also, again, I'm linking to my references, but there is a really cool book by Thomas and Tiffany where they spend an entire chapter talking about that. So for everyone who wants to get started with this, this chapter is, it's gold, it's really good. Um, and then, as a last thing with Python, it's kind of similar to R, but I think a bit better in a way because I found it more approachable. So you also get beautiful websites and it's it's usually done with either, either Sphinx or MKDocs, but I like MKDocs a lot. So I tried both and I feel if you come from Hugo, MKDocs, and in particular the material theme for MKDocs, it's really golden. It's, it's a really nice approachable tool that you have where that's the starting website that you see once you go to further documentation. Um, it has really beautiful out of the box features um, that makes it, that let you host, uh, that, that makes it beautiful A eh? and it lets you host static HTML websites. Um, and this is what the overview Pi website for instance looks like. And it looked like that within five minutes. So it's really, Again, it builds also up on your documentation, but the customization, at least for me, I felt this were, was more approachable in a way. And now, um, summing up in a way and thinking what we can get out of it from, from, from these experiences and also um, for you and for your kind of develop, developing community. So my lessons learned are it's easy to translate your package. Of course, it depends on the complexity of your functions and your architecture, but if it's a relatively simple package as overview R, it can be easily done if you're more or less convenient using these languages. So there are no major changes that you have to do unless like, I remember I once was working with Java, which I have absolutely no idea about, but working there, it was really painful. And in comparison to that, it was so smooth um, to set everything up. Um, so I would, I, I think it's, it's definitely an endeavor that is worthwhile. Um, and then as well, both communities, both OSS communities that you have are fantastic. They get, give you lots of feedback and support. And there are also plenty of open access materials available that help you to get your package up and running quickly. And, um, Again, I mean, we see the Slack channels being posted here. So you should definitely join them because there are so many like-minded people who are also looking or eager to dive into um, finding a solution for the puzzle that you're probably also looking for. So it's really comforting being in these kind of um, communities. And then as a last point, um, that's something that I haven't mentioned so far, but for PyPy, there's an intermediate step and it's called test pi pi. And I think this concept is really promising um, because what test pi pi does, um, it kind of ensures that you can upload and access your package and that it works for everyone. And if we think a bit beyond that, and that was actually what I was thinking when I first heard about test pi pi, couldn't we have something like this, probably a test cran or something like this, um, where you share your package with others, let them test it and let your package mature. And most importantly, save your name for the true package index that comes later so that you don't rush and push something that is still experimental. People would know 
that something that is on test pi, pi is somewhat rigorously tested, but probably with less strict rules, but it still adheres to certain standards. People can test it. They know what they're getting into if they're using the packages there. And once it's ready, you can smoothly push it to the real package index and have it there as well. And with that, um, here are all the resources that I would definitely recommend. It's a couple of books, couple of blog posts, and also two really nice um, GitHub repos that are collecting um, uh, tools that you can use for package development, one for R and one for Python. Um, and with that, thank you very much for, for joining. And I'm curious for any question that might might there still be. Well, wow, that was absolutely fantastic. Thanks, Cosme. That was uh, a really engaging presentation um, and seems to have triggered a little bit of discussion over on the Slack channel. And I think whilst everyone on is absorbing that, I'm going to hand over to Zoe to, to sort of round up our day. Well, I'm going to do some closing notes, but uh, before you go, Cosma, uh, I just want to ask one question. So you did your first package in R. Yes. I kind of find the difficult thing to do it in Python would be resistance in my own head <laughs> of, <laughs> you know, you, you just probably see all the benefits in the first language that you've used. How did you tackle that? Was this a necessity, curiosity, or something else that kept you going? Because it's so easy to go, oh, it's just, it's R makes it easy. Why am I doing this? It's such a different environment. What kept you going? And I know that's true. I think it's kind of like learning a different language. So when you know how to speak French and then you start learning Spanish, it feels like, hey, I do know French. I know how these things are pronounced. I know how, how to formulate sentences. Why do I have to do it in Spanish? I think you have to get over this kind of hilly feeling that you have there. And once you're there, you kind of see the beauty of the other language and you kind of see. So what I really enjoy, enjoy about Python is that the functions are so easy to read. And that's the beauty where you, you can also get that in R, but I feel like it's in, in Python, it's sometimes a bit clearer. And so you have a bit more words in a way to formulate things that you can also formulate in, a, in another language, but it's just in a different way, you know? So there are some kind of sayings in French that sound nicer in French than in Spanish, for instance. And that's how I felt when doing that. So I, I think this kind of pushed me to, to continue working on that. That's wonderful. And it's nice to also link it back to the spoken language because I think we do have difficulty sometimes learning particularly from uh, British speaking English speaking I should say rather than British speaking there's several things altogether learning other languages is really hard <laughs> it is very hard um, I agree thank, <laughs> thank you so much and um, I will close the session now but I'll, I'll just do my little speech so I want to thank everybody uh, for attending today and all the speakers um, it's a great conference that we've had because of the speakers giving their time and their expertise and I for one really appreciate it. I also want to give special thanks to my helper today, Lynn, taking the pressure off some of the concentration that's required around keeping things together. Immensely helpful and I'm so, so grateful for everybody's help. The questions that people posed as well, thank you, and keeping the conversation going. That's really lo lovely in the Slack groups. So this is uh, our last virtual session is tomorrow and it will start at one o'clock UK time. And we're going to start actually with our first keynote, our last keynote, I should say, first of the day, but the last for the sessions that we've got virtually. And it's Bruno Rodriguez on doing data science that stands the test of time with reproducible analytical pipelines. And that's kind of a big thing that we're talking about at the moment in the NHS. Our government and civil service colleagues actually coined the phrase and you may have heard of it as RAP. Um, so we're a little bit behind, but we're scrambling to keep up with them, I think. And so that's going to be really good amongst other talks, including plenaries of 20 minutes and lightning talks of 10 minutes as well. So I really look forward to seeing everybody speaking tomorrow and everybody in the room virtually with us. And don't forget that these are recorded and we put onto YouTube in due course. So thank you very much. I hope you all have a wonderful evening and goodbye from us. <laughs>